some of the challenges I've experienced um, with caregiving, specifically regarding my mom, um, is for me trying to locate all the services that are available. I, I feel the older adults here in California um, within my community are challenged with um, language barrier, um, isolation because they don't know where to go within um, our community. So housing, I think, is one of the most important challenges for any older adult who uh, together, you know, who are low income. The second challenge I saw for them is transportation. Because many of them suffer isolation because they don't know, or they don't drive because of age, or they never drive. But I do wonder what would happen to me if suddenly I became ill or something and I couldn't continue, I couldn't work, you know. I, um, you know, it's not like I don't have children. So I have no caregivers. I would probably end up in long-term care. So that's where I'm kind of- I know I was a caregiver for my father who's passed away. And one of it is just money. You know, things are expensive. Uh, he was in memory care. And fortunately he had some money put away. So he was able to stay in that. So for me in the future, the issue is going to a place that's friendly to LGBTQ uh, individuals because most of these rest homes and uh, facilities are kind of made for straight people. That's actually one of the big problems in our community is that when they go into lawn care or, you know, like a nursing home or assisted living, they often have to go back into the closet because they're worried about safety issues. Since I'm partially blind, I could use a caregiver and I wish they could improve that for elderly people, people that not just elderly, but the people that have a disability. In housing, they really helped me, even if I was on the waiting list for three years, because I can't afford a one-bedroom $1,600 a month. So it was a struggle. It was worth the wait, even if it was a struggle. I am living independently um, in a senior community, um, medium income property in Irvine and they have some programs uh, that they offer, but it doesn't pertain to me and my needs. For what I need, I, it needs to be very specific for the low vision or blind community. The California Master Plan on Aging has five major goals and they're all fantastic. But the one that jumps out at me is the affordability on aging. I am very blessed that my mother was in a financial position so that I could afford with the long-term care to place her in a fantastic facility. Um, but I'm lucky. A lot of families aren't as lucky to have that. The master plan uh, for aging, it seems like all those, all those items, the five goals really tied together. And it's really all about inclusibility, accessibility and affordability, making sure that uh, the health care is reimagined so no matter what you go in with what is your issue if you're if you're transgender if you're cisgendered whatever it is that people uh, know about it and uh, can deal with your issues and not make you feel like embarrassed to go in because that's why a lot of people I don't think go into health care because uh, they feel like they won't understand them so that's important I am hoping that this master plan works for all elders um, especially the ones that migrate here and don't know where to go. And for someone who doesn't speak the language, they don't understand, like, why do I need to fill this out? It'll just make the process easier for them to adapt. Master plan on aging is very important to me because it's going to make options available that aren't available now as far as aging in place, activities, uh, hopefully transportation. One of the things I would love to see, well, lots of things I would like to see, you know, the, the master plan address would be to ease housing and food insecurity. And um, to kind of ease the fear that most retirees have about outliving their money. Because no, it's unpredictable. Since we don't know when we're going to actually go, we don't know how much money we're actually going to need. People need to understand that an older adult is an active person. The an older adult is a person who has wishes and goals. Not because you are 65, 70, 75, you don't have goals or, or, or dreams, right? So I think my message is to help older adults to reach their goals and dreams. Hello, 
I'm Holly Hagler, President and CEO of Meals on Wheels Orange County. We are pleased to sponsor today's event. Since 1967, we've been the largest nonprofit provider of nutrition and supportive services for at-risk older adults in our county. We're committed to erasing hunger and isolation through nutritious meals, safety checks, friendly connections, and keeping families together through adult day services. Please visit us at mealsonwheelsoc.org. The California Master Plan for Aging was written with you in mind. Thank you for joining us to help improve aging in Orange County. The need for community support for aging older adults is rapidly increasing and the California Master Plan needs to be implemented at the local level. With your help, we'll make great strides to further improve the aging experience in Orange County. Hello. I'm Marco Rodriguez from the Orange County Aging and Disability Resource Connection, also known as the Orange County ADRC. The Orange County ADRC links older adults and people with disabilities to the resources that they need to live independently. Our staff can help connect you with a variety of services and supports, such as housing, in-home care, home modifications, assistive technology, and more so that you or your family member can stay safe and independent in our community. Please call area code 714-480-6450 to speak with one of our professional call center staff. The Master Plan for Aging provides us with an opportunity to improve the lives of older adults across our state. By joining us today, you are ensuring that this plan meets the needs of our community here in Orange County. Thank you for being a part of this important initiative and for helping to shape the future of aging in California. Hello, I'm Jack Light, Director of the Caregiver Resource Center OC. Caregiver Resource Center is a proud sponsor of Mastering the Master Plan and I welcome you. Our organization has been serving Orange County family and caregivers since 1989. We provide free supportive services and grant funding to family caregivers addressing the challenges of caregiving. Please visit our website at www.caregiveroc.org for more information. The California Master Plan for Aging was written to address the changing dynamics of aging in place. Thank you for providing the Orange County perspective about the needs of older adults and their families. With your support, the master plan can be tailored and implemented in the best way possible that serves the needs of families in Orange County. Again, welcome and thank you for joining us today. My name is Patty Mouton and I serve as Vice President at Alzheimer's Orange County. Our not-for-profit agency provides care and support of people experiencing all forms of dementia and the families who love them. Alzheimer's Orange County is delighted to sponsor today's event, Mastering the Master Plan. Since 1982, our programs and services have educated, advocated for, and supported people living with dementia, as well as the family and professionals who care for them. The California Master Plan for Aging was written with the families we serve and with all of you in mind. Thank you for joining us today to learn about this important initiative and to participate in crafting the local playbook. It's up to all of us to determine how we will change and enhance the way we age here in Orange County. Thank you. Hello, I'm Lisa Bartlett, supervisor for the fabulous 5th District, and I'm honored to join my colleagues and fellow Orange County leaders as we take an in-depth look at California's Master Plan for Aging and what it means for Orange County's older adult population. My district is home to approximately 150,000 residents aged 60 and over, representing over 23% of the county's aging population. Over the years, I've met with many seniors in my district, and I'm acutely aware of the economic challenges some of them face daily in order to meet ends meet. As such, it is critical we have a plan in place to address economic security among current and future older populations. Goal number five of the Master Plan for Aging, titled Affording Aging, aims to close the equity gap and increase economic sufficiency among seniors. Economic security is essential to living and aging well, 
but retirement income is being outpaced by the rising cost of housing, healthcare, and other essential needs. Individual retirement savings are not what they used to be, and private pension plans are declining. It is reported that nearly half of all U.S. households are headed by someone aged 55 or older with no retirement savings, leaving many to heavily rely on Social Security income to carry them through their retirement years. Given the rising costs of housing, healthcare, food, and other essential needs, surviving on Social Security income alone can be challenging to say the least, and for many, detrimental to their physical and mental health and well being. While there are programs and resources available to support aging residents, more can be done particularly to break the stigma many feel about seeking assistance. I look forward to the positive trajectory and critical work that will come out of the master plan to improve the economic stability of our aging population. Thank you. Hello, this is Supervisor Andrew Doe, Chairman of the Orange County Board of Supervisors. I represent the first district, which includes the cities of Santa Ana, Garden Grove, Westminster, portions of Fountain Valley and Midway City. By 2030, California's older adult population is expected to double. To begin improving how we all age in California over the next decade, the state released a master plan for aging earlier this year. Under bold goal number four of the plan, the target is to provide one million high quality caregiving jobs in the next 10 years. Across California, almost 5 million family caregivers help their parents, spouses, and friends who need assistance with everyday tasks to live well in their homes and communities. Of these, over a third are caring for someone with Alzheimer's disease or dementia, usually with little support or training. Women of color are providing a disproportionately large share of this care often while simultaneously caring for their own children. Under this goal, California is set to pursue caregiving through three strategies. Family and friends caring support, good caregiving job creation, and virtual care expansion. Through the Master Plan for Aging, strategies will be considered to provide caregivers with culturally competent options that not only improve their own health, financial outlook, and quality of life, but also those of the person for whom they are caring for. Good morning, I'm Katrina Foley, Orange County Supervisor representing District 2. District 2 spans all the way from La Palma, Los Alamitos, and south all the way to Newport Beach. District 2 also comprises the highest population of older adults ages 60 and over. About 179,000 residents in District 2 are ages 60 or older. And I'm happy to share with bold goal number three, inclusion and equity, not isolation. This issue is one that's near and dear to my heart and on which I have personal experience. This goal is targeted to keep increasing life satisfaction as we age with digital technologies fostering new opportunities for connections and inclusion in work, play, culture, and commerce, we have more than 2 million Californians who don't have access to technology or to high-speed internet. Recognizing this gap, I'm proud to have voted with my fellow colleagues on the Board of Supervisors for a recently authorizing of a program to provide equipment, training, and technical support services to older residents so that we can bridge the technical divide. But much more work can be done. A cornerstone of building a California for all ages provides strategies for engaging and meaningful opportunities for older residents to remain connected, active, and involved. This is especially meaningful to me as someone who cares for my 74-year-old mom and my 94-year-old grandmother. I have seen personally the challenges with isolation, disengagement, and inability to access technology. This is something that we must address soon because our older residents deserve more. Older Californians have much to contribute to our society 
and to younger generations, developing opportunities for older residents to work, volunteer, and provide other forms of engagement allows for multi-generational exchanges. And this will enhance the quality of life for all, those especially who have worked so hard for us. Thank you. Hello, I'm Doug Chafee, the Vice Chairman of the Orange County Board of Supervisors and your fourth district supervisor. I'm honored to represent the cities of Fullerton, La Harbor, Brea, Placentia, and portions of Anaheim and Buena Park. I am pleased to be included in this Mastering the Master Plan event and to introduce you to bold goal number two, Health Reimagined. This goal is targeted to close the equity gap in and to increase life expectancy. Consider these statistics. Nearly half of all Californians will acquire one or more chronic illnesses. Nearly nine in 10 older adults take at least one prescription drug with one in four finding these costs to be unaffordable, even with insurance coverage. As more Orange County residents live longer, many will seek care to allow them to live in optimal health where they are most comfortable, at home. Critically, these services are often unaffordable for individuals, particularly for middle-income older adults covered by Medicare only, which still largely does not cover these home and community services. Over half of older adults will eventually need home care or adult day care to assist them with daily activities such as meal preparation, physical activity, and bathing. California's in-home supportive services, which allows residents to remain in their homes by providing home caregiving services to older and disabled adults, is a national leader in this model of care. In Orange County alone, we currently provide over 30,000 clients per month with in-home supportive services. Access to health care at all ages is a foundation for healthy living and aging. And California leads the nation in health care coverage for these older adults, most recently through the expansions of Medi-Cal, Health Insurance, and Covered California, California's Health Insurance Exchange. Through the Master Plan for Aging, strategies will be pursued to increase access of health care services. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. We are broadcasting live from the Lakeview Senior Center here for the master plan. Before we get started, we want to invite Supervisor Wagner from the 3rd District to start things off. Supervisor Wagner. Thank you all very much. And uh, you saw my colleagues by video, I'm here because we are in the third district. So a quick welcome to everybody in, uh, in the third district for joining us here at the Lakeview Senior Center. Thank you to the Senior Center for hosting us, providing these facilities. And to be honest with you, I've been here for many, many events. Uh, these folks are great community members, great community champions, and I wanna thank all of you um, for, for being here. Um, I am asked first, to lead you in the Pledge of Allegiance. And I want to tease you, you heard from my colleagues four of the bold goals for master planning. Wait for it, I got number five for you. But first, if you're able, please join me in a pledge to the flag of the nation that allows us to meet, allows us to come together as a community, allows us to share ideas, and allows us to provide for each other. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. A couple of quick points before I uh, uh, relinquish the and uh, one of them is, is this. The issue of aging, frankly, is important to all of us. It came home to me when I noticed it happening and thought, wow, that happened quick. <laughs> and I was privileged to represent early in my career the city of Laguna Woods, which of course has uh, an elder population. And I asked for and found myself in Sacramento in the legislature on the aging committee, 
where these issues are grappled with, where I first learned the phrase, the silver tsunami, and realized that demographic chains just were coming at us inexorably, that were driving the age of our population up, the needs of that population become that much more critical to all of us as a society. And we found ourselves grappling with, in Sacramento, the issues that led ultimately to what the state has rolled out, its own California Master Plan for Education. Statistics in my district, there are, first of all, 700,000 adults age 60 and over here in Orange County. And they are roughly divided throughout the five supervisorial districts. I have about 100 and, uh, what have I got, about 119,000. I think it's about 18% of, of that number right here in the third district. And the, um, the, the truth is, not only has aging kind of crept up on all of us and the need for something like the master plan become more and more apparent, but COVID and the pandemic that we've all gone through put a stark light on some of our elderly population. We saw through COVID, it, it revealed or in some ways increased uh, senior feelings of isolation, issues of food insecurity, issues of housing insecurity. And so as a community today, we are coming together to grapple with those issues, talk them through and work through the master plan that um, hopefully will allow us to get a handle on the issues. Um, with respect to that master plan, you heard from my colleagues the four of the five broad goals. If you're here, you've got on your table uh, some information on those goals. But uh, if you're at home, let me go through goal number one. And uh, apologies as I scroll through with old eyes a uh, uh, bit of information. Goal number one is housing for all stages of life. My colleague Supervisor Bartlett touched on housing a little bit, but let me go into more detail. This goal is targeted to providing new housing options for residents to age well. As individuals age, their housing needs change. Older adults may need housing that allows for different household sizes, are accessible to transportation options, close to green belts, parks, open spaces, near medical services, near shopping, and allow for continued engagement and connectedness in the community. Housing policies for owners and renters, for all races and all ages, for living alone, must be grounded in equity to address discrimination and to advance greater housing options and accessibility for all. Some older adults and people with disabilities need specialized transportation services, such as door-to-door -door paratransit and escorts to physician's office, accessible transportation networks of buses and additional options to keep people of all ages, of all abilities, connected to services, connected to social opportunities, and of course, connected to community activities, which research tells us is one of the keys to aging well. So again, this is something coming for all of us. This is something that we have been thinking about at the state level and the local level for a long time. And this is the opportunity of the community to learn what we're doing, to learn how you can help further that planning and learn collectively how all of us can age well. Thanks for coming out. Thanks for your interest and participation in today's town hall. I welcome shortly many of my colleagues, uh, local elected officials who are very much committed to helping all of us through this process and helping all of us to age well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Supervisor Wagner. Before we begin, our community has lost a major leader this week, Dr. Marilyn Diddy. She was a trailblazer, innovator, mentor, professor, advocate, influencer. Orange County has lost a force for good, a force dedicated to the well-being of older adults. Dr. Marilyn Diddy, the founder emeritus of AgeWell, was a quintessential pioneer of senior services in Orange County, beginning in 1978. 
Many OC senior care professionals learned from her, followed her lead, and benefited from her experience, her energetic drive to enhance the lives of those she served. The entire senior services community of Orange County mourns her death and deeply appreciates all her foundational contributions to the health and happiness of older adults. We extend our sincere condolences to her family. We wish her Godspeed and a gentle rest. Now we welcome everyone to Mastering the Master Plan. We're delighted you are all here today and uh, welcome you. My name is Steve Shanahan. I'm a former mayor and city council, member, city council member for the great city of La Palma. I'll be your MC and moderator for today's important event. A couple of quick reminders. This event is being recorded and will be distributed at a later date. We're also streaming live to anyone watching us virtually. The first part of our event will have three speakers from, Cal from the CA Master Plan and what's happening at the local level in Orange County. The second half of our event will consist of a town hall with the elected officials. Now, if you have questions for the elected officials, if you're looking at watching this virtually, you can go into the Q&A feature and type in your question. If you're at a senior center, um, they have kiosks set up that where you can manually type in that question, and there may even be an opportunity to fill out a card. So those who are part of the Lakeview Center, those, that is the opportunity for that. Those virtually, go ahead and do it in the Q&A button uh, there in the middle. For our first speaker, Amanda Lawrence, MPH, is the project director of the Master Plan for Aging at the California Department of Aging, also known as CDA. Immediately prior to joining CDA, Amanda served as strategist and program consultant on several projects in the California Department of Public Health, including the launch of the department's Healthy Aging Initiative. Following gradua graduation from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, a passion for health and social justice led her to earn a Master of Public Health degree and to work for international, community-based, and healthcare nonprofits promoting health and equity, and equity, including the planning and implementation of community organization events and efforts with and for, for adults in Nicaragua. We'll turn things on over to Amanda. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me at your Master Plan for Aging event. I'm very excited to be joining folks in Orange County again to talk about this amazing 10-year vision that we have put together. Um, the Master Plan for Aging launched in January. Uh, very excited. It's been, I can't believe it, almost 10 months of implementation. Uh, today, I'm joining you to go over a bit of what the Master Plan for Aging means for the state of California, what it means for you locally, and how you can craft your own Master Plan for Aging. Um, as well as talk about some of the data we have available. And I'll just do a quick overview of the five bold goals that comprise this plan, as well as um, the strategies and our first two years of initiatives that um, we have several commitments to advance um, for the next year and a half. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and dive into sort of why we created a master plan for aging. Um, there's been years and years of advocacy for California to create its own master plan for aging. Only a handful, handful of other states have done so. And really, truly, the reason why is kind of obvious. Aging is changing, and it's changing California. People are living longer. And pre-COVID, California had the second longest life expectancy in the country. It was at almost 82 um, years of age. Um, and with living longer comes lots of implications. And I know we can all think about our own lives and what aging means to us. We all have older adults in our lives. So as I talk about the plan, just think about your own aging process, but also those folks in your lives, the people you serve, but really your parents, your grandparents, your children too. Um, this plan is really meant to be for everybody because we are all aging <laughs> and we want to uh, age well in California. Let's see, and not only are we all aging and, and living longer, but this means that demographically, we're going to see more older folks comprise our population than ever before. So on this chart, the bar chart on the left, um, you'll see that the dark blue block right there are zero to 18 year olds, and that orange block is the 60 plus. 
And so back in 2010, we had about many, many more younger folks than older folks. And then right about now, we're about even by 2030, they'll actually be about 27% of California's population as 60 plus, whereas only about 22% will be 18 and under. And then by 2060, it'll be 30% of Californians will be 60 and over. And so we really need to think about these changes. Um, not only have do we have sort of stereotypes and preconceived notions of what it means to age, and it's just looking so much different, more different now than it ever has before. People aging differently, living with different family members, changing family dynamics, working longer. So we really need to prepare California from both a policy and a program perspective for these changing demographics. Um, not only are we living longer, but we're actually becoming a much more and more diverse state. Older adults are no different. So back in 2010, the vast majority, we're talking 60% of older adults were white non-Hispanic. In 2030, that's just going to be around 40 something percent. And then by 2060, only about 23% of older Californians will be white non-Hispanic. So we're going to see a growth in these minority populations. And that really means we need to think about not just cultural competency and how we really develop and design our services, our policies, and our programs to serve existing older adults, but also to think about that, that lifelong, that lived experience of facing systemic discrimination and racism and now confronting ageism. So there's a lot of built up trauma. There's a lot of um, other issues that we need to deal with, both in just breaking down all existing systems, but in particular, also addressing um, the diversity um, and different perspectives as folks are growing older and become older adults. And my next slide. So I want to talk a little bit about how we got here. Of course, to create a 10 year plan for California, we did not do that overnight. So we held over a year of public engagement and stakeholder engagement activities. Um, we had three different stakeholder committees comprised of experts from across the state. Um, we had community roundtables that were hosted by legislators. We also aligned our efforts with the Task Force on Alzheimer's Disease Prevention and Preparedness, which is chaired by Maria Shriver. And then really importantly, we worked with the governor's cabinet. So we wanted to make sure that this plan wasn't just seen as a plan to be implemented by aging and health and human services departments and agencies, but really that an aging lens was applied to everything that we do in California government, including how we write our budget. So we had the agency secretaries from across the governor's cabinet come together regularly as a work group and provide input and review stakeholder recommendations and ultimately that resulted in this 10-year plan and for the first two years we have 132 specific initiatives that every member um, of the cabinet has committed to and then also COVID-19 happened during this process um, and it continues to happen but um, we did take a break in the planning process for about two or three months to just really pivot and focus our efforts on COVID-19 rapid response. Of course, we're serving a community that was the hardest hit by COVID-19. So we really took that opportunity, of course, to pivot and to innovate. And there's so many lessons learned from that experience about how we can improve services, particularly skilled nursing facilities um, for older adults in California. And county engagement was really important um, in the development of the master plan for aging. We had Board of Supervisor Catherine Barger on the Stakeholder Advisory Committee. She's from Nevada County. Uh, San Diego and Los Angeles both presented their county plans for aging. We also had did site visits across the state. Um, we also heard from Monterey. We heard from Orange County. We just really listened and learned from a lot of local partners across the state as to how we can actually create a plan that would be useful at the local level and really reflective of the diversity um, of California with the different regions we have, different cultures we have represented in this state. So in the end, January 7th, 20, January 6th, 2021, we launched um, the Master Plan for Aging. We held a few, um, press briefings and a major summit with our cabinet secretary partners. 
um, to unveil this plan and what it culminated in out of over 800 recommendations from stakeholders was this 10 year plan with five bold goals, 23 strategies, and then those 132 initiatives specifically to launch into the first two years of this plan. While we have those initiatives and we are working on them, there is also just so much more to the master plan. And we've been blessed with um, quite a budget this year and some fantastic legislation to really advance these strategies um, beyond just those initiatives that we've selected. I'm gonna go through each one of these goals pretty quickly. Um, goal one is housing um, for all ages and stages. I think this is the number one topic we've heard about from stakeholders in the public, is we need affordable housing and appropriate housing for older adults. We really want to ensure that Californians can live where we choose as we age, in communities that are age, disability, and dementia friendly, as well as climate friendly and disaster ready. So we know that our housing needs change over time. And the house we live in when we're 60 might be not the appropriate house for when we're 70 or 80. So in order to keep people in homes, as long as that is safe and healthy for them, um, we want to see the appropriate sorts of units built, affordable units. Um, I would say more of a um, user-centered design going into the building of these universal access, I should say. So um, we have some initiatives in here for how can we make existing homes, people who are in their homes and want to stay there, how can we make their housing more friendly and uh, to them as they age, such as uh, providing modifications to prevent falls, um, weatherization, which also helps with uh, that climate friendly aging. Um, we of course don't wanna just talk about the housing unit itself, it's also the community. This is sort of like the social determinants of health, um, AARP livable community sort of goal is how I think of it. So we're also talking about transportation. We absolutely have to rethink transportation and make it more accessible for older adults and adults with disabilities. Um, right now, there are several instances I've heard of where just to go a few miles, it can take someone several hours. They can't uh, rely on transportation to get them to an appointment at a certain point in time, at a specific time. So there's a lot of challenges that adults, older adults and people with disabilities face when trying to use public transit. Um, we also wanna make driving safer and we wanna make walking and cycling safer as well. So if you dive into this goal area, you'll see some initiatives in these strategies that relates to um, driver and active, driver safety and active transportation as well as public transportation. Um, outdoor and community spaces for all ages. Um, older adults are actually one of our, um, they make up I think the majority of volunteers in our public parks, but they actually barely use them for their own enjoyment. So want to find out how we can get spaces that are more accepting and open to older adults so they feel comfortable and safe, um, enjoying our natural environment that we're blessed with here in California. Um, emergency preparedness and response. Older adults and people with disabilities are the most disproportionately impacted people in California. And um, with the, the wildfire season, you know, lengthening and lengthening every year and that um, ever present, you know, threat of earthquake, we really need to be sure that we have the correct tools to communicate with um, everyone, whether it's a rural or an urban community, older adult, people with disabilities, and make sure that they can access safe spaces during um, disasters and um, emergencies. And then climate friendly aging is really just the smart thing to do. And basically, if you're going to make build a plan a new community, age friendly and climate friendly really do overlap really well. So um, you can dive into those initiatives when you investigate goal one. So goal two is health reimagined. And really what we want to see here is that we all have access to the services we need to live at home and in our communities and to optimize, optimize our health and quality of life. So our target here is to close the equity gap in and increase our life expectancy. I mentioned before, we are taking a life expectancy hit during COVID, so we do have a lot of um, years to make up for. Um, strategies here, really, the first one is bridging healthcare with home. So it's sort of that segue from a goal one to goal two, where we um, want to be able to see people accessing home and community-based services, those long-term support services. Um, in their home to actually be able to afford those, to have them be culturally responsive and competent, um, and really to modernize a lot of these services. Um, in addition to having um, you know, just com community-based services, um, 
and other resources in the community that really help people thrive and maintain lives in their own homes. Other strategies in this goal area are going to take a life course perspective and focus on um, community education around certain health issues, particularly brain health. Um, also behavioral health, um, providing sort of resources that are targeted specifically for older adults. We have a lot of improvement to make on that front. Um, geriatric care expansion, really important. When you see all of these, the population shifting towards these older years, these later years in life, we don't have that many uh, geriatricians to uh, serve older adults in the medical facilities, but we also, not just that, want to be sure that we have these multidisciplinary teams to provide that sort of whole person, whole person care to folks. So the social workers and the CNAs and behavioral health therapists, we would love to see everyone have some sort of training in gerontology or geriatrics. And also um, we've seen across California, thanks in part to West Health Institute down in San Diego, this emergence of an expansion of uh, geriatric uh, certified emergency departments. I'm really exciting to see those flourish. Um, and of course, nurse dementia and um, Alzheimer's disease is found in this goal area. You'll see several initiatives related to that. They're in alignment with that, um, with the, uh, the governor's task force on Alzheimer's disease prevention preparedness. Um, strong alignment with the recommendations that came out of that group are also in the master plan for aging. And a lot of that work comes out of the Department of Public Health. And then nursing home innovations, of course, um, taking those lessons learned during COVID and advancing um, nursing home innovation. Goal three is inclusion and equity, not isolation. So we felt that equity deserved its own goal, but it also is threaded throughout the plan itself, but still we wanted to call it out. I um, mean, particularly this not isolation part, because we want to ensure that Californians have lifelong opportunities to really just be engaged in society, to work, to volunteer, to hold leadership positions, um, and then also to be protected from physical um, abuse, mental abuse, neglect, exploitation, financial abuse, um, and really just isolation and loneliness. Um, so our target here is to keep increasing life satisfaction as we age. And our strategies um, include, and, and most of these strategies are actually led by the California Department of Aging. Um, it's really to um, provide like appropriate language services. And you can see in the budget this year that Cal HHS received 20 million to improve language access. So we're gonna be doing a lot more work um, in providing materials and services and programs in multiple languages. Um, closing the digital divide, of course, it's important, kind of fits into almost every goal area really because we want people to be able to connect with their friends, their families, their caregivers, and their healthcare providers. Um, so we've been working on providing outreach and education and actual, uh, tablets and other sorts of devices to older adults through our area agencies on aging so that um, a lot of these older adults who in particularly in particular have been staying at home to stay safe during COVID have the ability to communicate with their loved ones and to really keep human connection. Also the opportunities to work. Um, age discrimination is real, particularly when it comes to working. Some people find purpose and meaning in work and would like to continue to do it later in their later years in life. Some folks actually need to do it for financial reasons. So there's some initiatives in this strategy, um, in these strategies to really promote flexible work models and other things that would be more inclusive of older adults in the workforce. Um, we also have uh, some initiatives in here related to um, improving older adult volunteerism in certain sectors and also some intergenerational work. Um, intergenerational activities are beneficial for people of all ages, not just for older adults. So there's some ideas in there to really sort of bridge the divide between generations. Um, we see uh, some models like the village movement have been doing some intergenerational and some diversity, equity, and inclusion work. And uh, we'll be uh, partnering on some webinars next year to share lessons learned and best practices from that. Um, and then of course, protection from abuse, neglect, and exploitation. Uh, next month, we'll be announcing the California um, Elder and Disability Justice Coordinating Council. It's the first time organizations and advocates from across the state are coming together, facilitated by the Health and Human Services Agency, as well as uh, the Attorney General, to uh, collectively 
uh, protect older adults from various forms of abuse, neglect, and exploitation. So we'll have stakeholders who are from victims' rights uh, related to violence. We'll have folks in there who um, work on protections for financial abuse, all sorts of, um, I think it's going to be about 40 people, um, stakeholders and representatives from the state working together to create, like draw out this landscape, which I'm finding um, we're doing more and more for all of these issues is really identifying who is doing what, who has what funding, how can we actually come together and collectively address social issues rather than operating in our silos. And then that last strategy there is California leadership in aging. Very excited to announce that um, the governor just appointed the first ever senior advisor on aging, disability, and Alzheimer's disease, um, Kim McCoy Wade, my previous boss as of a week ago, um, has moved from being the director of the Department of Aging over into the governor's office. So having that voice there to really represent older adults, people with disabilities, and family members and people with uh, Alzheimer's disease is a major step forward for the state of California. And now I will talk about goal four, caregiving that works. Um, our goal here is that we will be prepared for and supported through the rewards and challenges of caring for aging loved ones. Um, our target here is 1 million high quality caregiving jobs. It literally is about how many we have to create. I think we have almost 700,000 direct care workers right now in California, but we need to create more jobs to make up for the folks who will leave the workforce, as well as the new jobs and positions we'll need to really tend to the um, fairly rapidly changing demographics in California. But it's not just about paid caregiving jobs, it's also about providing support to family caregivers, caregivers who are providing uh, support and care to friends. Um, so we have a couple strategies in here. So we've got family and friends caregiving support. Um, direct or the caregiver resource centers received some money in the most recent budget to really help um, address the sorts of skills and support that caregivers need um, caring for loved ones. Um, also in here we have an initiative related to providing um, just time off, paid, paid leave for folks who are caring for a loved one in the home. Um, and also um, opportunities to provide respite to folks who are providing care. Um, also good caregiving jobs. So. We know we need to pay caregivers more, but we also know we need to train them better. And we also need to create a career ladder for them. So if there's no one solution to this, we're not going to just create more caregivers by just paying more or providing more training. It really has to be a nice package deal where we're really providing people with um, a career and not, not just a job because these are very difficult jobs and um, really require you know special people who are very caring and um, really um, you know really thrive in the role of providing care for someone and then virtual care expansion which you know ties into digital divide there making sure that people have access to their caregivers um, or their and their healthcare workers um, via um, a digital means if necessary and then goal five is um, affording aging and so our goal here is that everyone in California will have economic security for as long as we live and our target is to close the equity gap in and increase elder economic sufficiency. Um, strategies in this goal area are related to um, ending homelessness for older adults, a um, major issue in California in particular. Adults aged 55 plus who are renters are the most at risk population in California to become homeless. And um, we also, and so luckily the budget has devoted um, millions of dollars and some several exciting programs that do help uh, create more housing for older adults and people with disabilities, really uh, providing transition care uh, or transitioning folks from care into homes, uh, particularly folks with some complex needs. And then um, some strategies in here are related to income security as we age. So really helping people um, have a means to, um, and the awareness to save for retirement. There's air earned income tax credit here. Uh, we mentioned the Cal ABLE program, which helps people with disabilities gain um, financial independence and security. And we additionally, we put into this goal area, protection from poverty and hunger. Um, California has really lagged in um, the enrollment of older adults in our CalFresh program. And um, we're seeing though, we're seeing some great progress there. And there are some initiatives for the first two years and they'll be ongoing. 
um, to really start to increase the amount of food that we can uh, provide for older adults, whether it's in congregate settings or home delivery or, um, or just via you know, their own shopping. So those are the five gold goals. Real quick tour. Um, so I just really encourage everyone, you go to our website, everything is laid out on the website. You can also print a report if you'd like. Um, and then I just wanna talk a little bit about next steps. Um, as I said, we have these 132 initiatives. We have 10 cabinet agencies and we have so many partners um, with locals, with private sector, federal government, as well as philanthropy to launch all of these initiatives over the first uh, two years. We'll revisit that, um, those initiatives you know, in two years and determine what's the next best step for the next two or four, or six years after that. And then um, we are currently implementing the master plan for aging. And so we do have a, a committee we call the impact committee who provide um, oversight or um, on the administration and implementation of the MPA and several other stakeholder committees who continue to really drive forward the priorities that have been laid out in the master plan for aging. Now, I'll talk a little bit about the data dashboard for aging. It's a really great tool for both state and local planners, advocates, um, government officials to check out. And this is also on the MPA's website. It's actually hosted by the Department of Public Health and their Let's Get Healthy California platform. And here it is, you can go ahead and you can access it on our landing page and at the bottom of our landing page for the master plan for aging. And there's some, the, the key data dashboard components include that landing page, um, which does include um, four, I believe it's, it's three or four tutorial videos to guide you through how to find the data you're looking for. I think it might be a little intimidating for some people. Um, and there's just a lot of data on there. So check out those tutorial videos. And then we have five goal pages um, that have data visualizations related to each strategy within the goal area. And we also have an indicator progress dashboard, which highlights statewide trends and key indicators on key indicators. And then we also have a demographic dashboard that provides a profile of older adult population in California at both the state and county levels. I'll show you what that looks like. So here's a snapshot of that demographic um, dashboard. And this is a great tool. You can go ahead and just enter in Orange County. Um, I'll just let you know right now, you have to aggregate by year um, to get county level data. You'll see what I mean when you log on. And uh, this is a great, this is just a great resource to take to your local decision makers, policymakers, and say, look at the changing demographics. We have um, education, we have income on here, or poverty level, we have insurance type, immigration status, all sorts of different indicators um, on this demographic snapshot that you can get for your county. And then here's more of a detailed view. You can drill down on um, various indicators for your county as well. I think not all of them are available by county, but as many as are available, we include in here. And then you can also check out the age distribution view for the indicators of the demographics that we have posted on the dashboard. And for an idea of what we actually have on the dashboard, these are our current indicators. Those with the purple carrots, um, we have local data available for. And then with the red asterisk, we have demographic data available for. Now this dashboard is always, it's continuous quality improvement through and through. We are constantly um, working on this. We'll be adding new indicators and of course, updating and refreshing the, the existing indicators to have the latest data available. Um, I'll just show you a handful of example visualizations. So this is the housing cost burden, which um, so we can tell from here that more than a third of older adults who rent their homes spend more than half of their income on rent. That's one example of data you can find in the dashboard. Um, we have income security and poverty data. So we can see that statewide and also broken down by county that 38% of older adults have income below their local cost of living. And protection from poverty and hunger. You can see here the share of older adults participating in CalFresh has been increasing. Great news. Um, particularly since the expansion of SSI recipients in 2019. We do have several um, indicators that we'll be adding soon. Um, we will continue to improve the data we have available on sexual orientation and gender identity. We have current indicators that we'll, we'll refresh with <clears throat> the most available data. 
most of a lot of our data comes from the California Health Interview Survey. And so um, we will just be adding the latest data as soon as we can and also adding indicators on caregiving and long term supports and services, um, as well as when you go on the dashboard, you'll see we have in we have uh, placeholder indicators. Those will have these little dash lines around them. Uh, we'll, we'll add those data as soon as they are available. Real quickly, I want to touch on the Master Plan for Aging Local Playbook. This is how you can take action to build um, a California, like for all ages in your own community. And so we designed this playbook to assist local and state governments and communities and private and philanthropic organizations to really start building age-friendly environments and disability-friendly communities. You can get this on our main master plan for aging website. The playbook has seven plays. They're outlined right here. I'll just briefly go through each one. Here's where you would access the local playbook on our website and you would find that play one is um, use this blueprint, our master plan for aging to engage your local leaders. And then if you click on any one of those um, white boxes, they will expand to share resources that we've sort of vetted. We've really tried to find the best resources out there to help with age-friendly planning. You can see on here local government. We have um, universities and colleges. California just has world-class researchers, um, so don't forget to tap into those. And also students who would love to do intergenerational work. Play, oh, and there's a even closer up of play one. <clears throat> Play two is explore local data. Data dashboard for aging is on here. Um, these are the five uh, dashboards we're sharing. Um, I think we'll probably expand it someday because actually there's some great housing dashboards that have been, have been hatched recently. Um, so excellent information on here. Elder economic index is really, uh, I think, valuable to really assessing um, how people are affording aging in California. Play three is review local age-friendly models. So on here, you can tap into other area agency on aging for your plans. We also selected a few um, plans from California as well as across the country. And I think even some international ones, dementia-friendly and LGBTQ focused plans are in here as well. Play four is to select your own uh, goal area for implementation. I, I wish this didn't say initiatives because you're gonna make your, up your own initiatives but uh, use the MPA as a guide, the goals and the strategies as a guide for how you might want to narrow the focus for your own county master plan for aging. And so you would go through, and this is one example, let's say you decided that you wanted to work on housing and transportation, you would go ahead and hit transportation beyond cars and it would expand to open up to show that um, those resources that are there on the right. Play five is build your action plan. And so we have some community planning resources and also specifically called out how you can bake equity into your planning. Um, loads of AARP resources in here. So I do want to give a shout out to AARP for just doing so much great work around age-friendly planning. And then evaluating your age-friendly program. Um, AARP, again, has a great resource. There are a couple other great resources in there for evaluating your framework. And then play seven is simple, just stay connected. Um, would love to hear from folks after they've written um, or developed their own master plan and what their implementation process has been like. So um, I don't think we'll be getting many stories real soon because I know uh, after having done it myself, it's a, it's a long process. Uh, if you're doing it right, it's not gonna happen overnight. So hope to get some stories coming, to, coming our way soon. And then this is how you can learn more about the Master Plan for Aging. Just visit that website. We also have a newsletter, um, goes out maybe once a week or so. And then you can always email us at engage at aging.ca.gov with any questions you have about the MPA. So that concludes my presentation. And I wanna thank you all again for having me and for this fantastic event and for really focusing on aging in Orange County. Amanda, thank you for being here this morning. We have a couple of quick questions that we wanted to uh, ask and, and hopefully you can give us some brief answers on these. Uh, number one, why is the California Master Plan for Aging so important? Okay, well, and again, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, really, I think if you go ahead and review the process of developing the Master Plan, you'll see why it's so important. Um, we spent over a year developing the plan and we received over 800 recommendations 
for things we can do to improve the lives of older adults and people with disabilities. So when you look at the demographic shifts, I mean, that's just numbers, that's obvious. We really need to prepare for um, a larger portion of our population being older and maybe aging with a disability or aging into a disability. But it's, it's so much more than that. It's that our society has for years really undervalued older adults. And we, um, you know, we, we fear aging, obviously, uh, anti-aging remedies, et cetera, are all the rage. So right now, I think there's several reasons why it's important. One is to reframe aging in, in a much more positive light, to celebrate the contributions of um, older adults and just all of us as we age. We are going to, you know, with luck, get to an older age in life. So um, we have just healthcare reasons, we have you know, housing reasons, we have so many reasons to really uh, put together a plan to help support not just older adults, but also family members of older adults and caregivers of older adults. Um, there's just so much opportunity out there right now. Um, so if you read the master plan, you'll see that it's complex, it's multifaceted, there's any number of different strategies and goal areas you could dive into to see a massive need for. Um, but also, um, you know, so much opportunity. And honestly, it's been so important that we've brought together all of these sectors to start to think about aging um, instead of just siloing aging into one particular state department or county department, but really viewing it as some sort of holistic whole society approach. What is the first step people should take when they're implementing the master plan, but at the local level? Yeah. Um, first step is check out the local playbook for the master plan for aging. Um, I know Orange County is working on, on your own and it's just so important for locals to voice your concerns and make your recommendations um, to the people who are um, organizing your, your aging plan efforts. Um, the plan just wouldn't be where we have it at if it weren't for all of that really intense stakeholder and public engagement we did for about, I think, 16 or 18 months. Um, so first, first step, get involved. Second step, then take all of your involvement, your ideas, your recommendations, and really start to engage your local leaders. That's our first step in our local playbook. Um, well, I hear time and time again from communities that engaging the Board of Supervisors, even by just something as simple as bringing that demographic um, screenshot that I shared earlier in the presentation from our dashboard, bringing that attention to the Board of Supervisors go, takes the plan a long, long way. So I really um, can't emphasize enough how important it is just to really raise your voice locally. What are some of the ways we can support family caregivers at home? Yes, there are so many ways. And I'm really excited about several of the budget investments that have come through in this year's state budget. So we do have $4 million that um, will go towards new training and certification for caregivers. We have Alzheimer's daycare and resource centers that can support families and caregivers who are caring for someone with Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, caregiving resource centers, which are just a great source of training, um, respite care, behavioral health services, et cetera, received $10 million in this year's budget. Um, we also, let's see, um, there's other ways too. There's really like housing. Like I said, everything's connected. Um, really easing the ability to, to build an affordable, sorry, an accessory dwelling unit or a granny flat as people call them. That's an opportunity for a caregiver to live on site. Um, so there's all sorts of ways, but really right now, I think what a lot of people need is, um, is skills, is, is skills, particularly if, if um, their loved one has um, Alzheimer's or dementia or some incredibly complex care needs. So those skills and resources that are provided by the Caregiving Resource Centers, by the Alzheimer's Association, these are invaluable. And perhaps I think, you know, maybe communicating the availability of these is um, an important first step in really providing uh, family and friends caregivers with, um, with what they need to provide care. You know, we, we know everyone is aging. You talked about that earlier and all the, the creams and anti-aging things we have. So it's not just for older adults, but how can we help people see that the master plan was written with everyone in mind? 
Yeah. Um, you know, we do try to make a point of sharing that every time we talk about the master plan is that it's really not just about older adults. It's um, not even just about the family and friends of older adults and those of us who serve older adults, but it's actually in our best interest, right? We are the future older adults. So the plan really is for everybody. And, you know, we live in a society and if everyone is well cared for, then we know everyone is going to do better. Um, so there's a lot of advantages and benefits to um, providing care to older adults and people with disabilities. It's just, um, it is so important to their families. It is so important to their communities. And it allows everyone to be more engaged and involved. If we really do have you know, uh, prevent the isolation of older adults and people with disabilities. If we create systems where they can be more engaged in the workplace, just, um, you know, just socially as well, uh, through volunteerism, everybody benefits from that. Um, so we can think about it, you know, you can think about it from a selfish standpoint if you want, um, but you can also think about, about the people in your, in your life. Um, it's one of those, it's one of those topics that brings everyone together. That's actually what we, we found in our meetings in particular with, um, other state leaders is that they would turn into long conversations about um, everyone's parent and grandparent and friends that they're caring for. So everyone relates to it. I think we just have to do a better job of probably dismantling um, ageism and that'll sort of open the door to including um, younger folks and getting them to start thinking about their, um, their whole life course, their future. Well, I appreciate your time. I know so many uh, that are watching today and will watch in the future. Um, uh, the information was incredibly valuable. So um, on behalf of everybody, thank you for being here this morning. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Oops, there we go. Thank you, Amanda, for those uh, um, just incredible, um, incredible information. Again, the, the California Master Plan for Aging, the website is mpa.org aging.ca.gov so mpa.aging.ca.gov all right our next speaker ellen young brings a breadth of experience from education to corporate partnerships from community development to innovative technology after 14 years in the classroom ellen has spent the last several years in philanthropy with a focus in technology of older adults and military veterans. In addition to her roles as the Vice President of Irvine Health Foundation, Ellen is the Director of Chapters and Community Engagement with Aging 2.0, a global organization working to accelerate innovations and solutions addressing various challenges and opportunities in aging, growing the network to 130 plus chapters throughout her tenure. Ellen has also been consulting with a number of companies focused on age tech and community resilience. Ellen resides in Orange County, California with her husband and their son. Please welcome Ellen to the stage. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you. I just want to say thank you so much um, for having me here today and I want to send a particular thank you to Emily and Patty and um, the Lakeview Senior Center for having us here today. This is just an incredible opportunity to finally be in person which is wonderful and it feels good to, to see faces again. Um, and also I just want to thank all of you for being here. I think this is an important conversation that we need to have and I'm glad that we're having it. And um, in addition, I want to say thank you to Amanda Lawrence working with her and Kim McCoy Wade has just been incredible. It really has been powerful. And uh, I think that the success of the master plan comes from what's been happening here at the California Department of Aging. Um, and I also want to just thank the, the county for committing to this effort and also to Governor Newsom for putting this executive order in place so that we can develop this plan, so that budget can be allocated towards this and resources. Um, I think that through the success of this plan, we're truly gonna see a California for all, which is exciting. Um, 
As you heard, I did spend 14 years as an educator. I was actually a middle school teacher. And usually when I tell people that, they say, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, middle school was an interesting time. I actually loved being a middle schooler. Um, and I loved teaching middle school. And I think that I, I mentioned that because middle schoolers are often overlooked. People always say, I'm so sorry, that's such a challenging age. Why would you do that? Um, because they're awkward and funny. And, um, and I think that for me, it was about that transition from childhood to young adulthood. And I think that that transition has resonated in my role here at the Irvine Health Foundation and in my career. Because I think as we're looking at how to help older adults, and at IHF, Irvine Health Foundation, we're also helping military veterans, it's all about transition, right? You're transitioning to new chapters, you're transitioning into civilian life, you're transitioning from working into retirement. And so I think for me, I see that transition as something really, really important to acknowledge. And um, for me also, older adults are really incredibly near and dear to my heart. As, as Amanda mentioned, I think as you start talking about older adults, we have some sort of story. And um, being a, a former teacher, I love to tell stories. And so I want to tell you that um, I used to be a caregiver for my grandparents. I grew up next door to my grandparents. And every day from kindergarten to 12th grade, I kid you not, I went to their house every single morning for breakfast every single morning and we had a menu we had certain things that we did on certain days and I, that's also how i got to have sugar cereal because my my grandparents you know they spoil their grandkids and so it was an incredible because i was able to see my grandparents every day all of some of my fondest memories are with my grandparents and have them included in it and and spending time with with calm grand and pops um was really really instrumental in my development as, as a child, as a young adult, and even in my career here today. And it was an absolute honor when my grandparents who were older started aging that in turn I became their caregiver, right? I was the one driving them to appointments. You know, I, I even picked my car. I remember when I, I, I got my first car, I picked my car to make sure that my grandparents could fit and that we could put their walker and their wheelchair in there. And, and um, it was such an incredible opportunity, but it was also a privilege because I got to spend so much time with them. I got to learn from them. I got to hear their stories and sometimes a lot of stories and <laughs> often repeated stories. But I look at that now and I think, oh my gosh, I wish I could hear those again. I wish I could continue to learn from them. And so I think for me, with my parents being working parents, um, what we saw was almost like that sandwich generation that we see so prevalent here today is that you know kids grandkids are, are caring for their parents but me as as a mom and a, a working woman um i i have a toddler at home and I'm, I'm caring for him and i'm trying to work from home in a pandemic but also being you know thinking about what does that look like as a caregiver for my family or if i have um, aging parents th that need some help and so I think that, that the issues are still the same that we've seen for a number of years, but I think in a pandemic, it's exacerbated, right? We have um, some ch new challenges that have come to the table. But I also think what that's done is it's created a new opportunity. We've seen that in COVID, um, things like telehealth, telemedicine have just gone into warp speed adoption, um, you know, it seems like everyone now knows what Zoom is and how, how to use it, which is really great. But I think what we're also seeing is the importance of starting to break down those silos. How do we start to work together? And I think that's what's so incredible about this master plan is that you're bringing everyone into a room to say, what are our key needs? What are our true issues? And how do we start to address those and address those together? especially because this population of older adults is growing and growing fast. And so as, as we at the Irvine Health Foundation and a lot of my work started digging into, you know, several years ago, what's here for older adults? And at the time, there wasn't a lot. You know, people weren't really talking much about it. And thankfully, you know, Jim McAleer and Alzheimer's Orange County came to, to IHF and said, hey, we're, we're trying to put together this strategic plan for aging. And I know... Um, Meals on Wheels and Holly Hagler and all these different folks came to the table and said, let's do it. 
How do we put together our own strategic plan for aging? And this was before the master plan came out. So we were ahead of the curve, Orange County, awesome. And, and so we started to say, how do we collaborate? How do we bring all the organizations together in a room? But also, how do we learn to work together? And so what we started to do, which is amazing that it aligns so well with the local playbook, is we started to set out these goals. And initially it was like 18 month goals and what do we need to achieve and how do we start to bring our strengths? We developed different pillars like transportation and food security and social isolation and technology and started to just create these really strong working relationships. And, and what was really neat about that was it all started to align with the master plan. It all started to come together and we started to say, hey, as we're working together, we see the states also working together. And, and then a pandemic hit and it was like, wow, this is serendipitous. And, um, and so when we, we were doing this work, IHF actually received an invitation to join the master plan at the funders level, um, which you may not have heard was, um, there are all these different stakeholder committees and things happening with the California Master Plan, but there's also a, a group of eight funding partners, and they're all foundations throughout the state, and um, Irvine Health Foundation being one of them. So, and what we've done is we've come together to say, hey, we're willing to put some money in the pot, but also what we're wanting to do is to make sure that different um, communities are represented, and, and for us at IHF, we wanted to make sure Orange County was represented. Um, but also that we were able to say, hey, we're not only represented, but we're going to learn from what's happening at the state level, bring it to the local level, and vice versa. And what I think we've seen with these, this funding consortium is just that it's allowed us to pivot and it's allowed us to work together, but work together quickly. We've been able to cut through so much red tape. We've been able to say, hey, how do we start to bring the best of the best into a room? And, and get things done. And I think that's why um, Amanda mentioned the, the process has taken a long time for the master plan, but I think when you're looking at the amount of work that's been done in a very short amount of time, it's pretty significant. And, and the good news is, is here in Orange County, we've been doing that work in parallel with the master plan, which puts us, I think, kind of ahead of the curve. We kind of have our own local playbook already underway. And, and so sitting at, um, both tables at the at the state level with the funding partners, but also here at um, what we call OC Spa, has been really insightful. I think what we've been able to do is start to pull together just incredible knowledge. Um, when we were, we have weekly meetings at the state level, and as we have these weekly meetings, we're learning from you know, all these different funding organizations like SCAN and, and what are they doing? What are they funding and what matters to them? And we're able to say, well, this is what matters to us. And then we start to say, okay, well, we've got the eight of us here. What are we missing? And if we're missing something, who do we need, we need to bring to the table? Or who do we need to invite? Or who do we need to, to start talking to so that we can start to make sure we move the needle, but also that everyone is represented here that it's not just, um, we're looking here for older adults. It's not just the older adults. It's the caregivers. It's the... I don't want to interrupt you, but we're not represented here, okay? <laughs> I'm telling you right now, my medical records were fraudulent. They got away with it, and I'm tired of this. These are all my records. I got a hold of Jill Biden. She's investigating. I got a letter here from the White House. It's going into investigation, but the system is corrupt. Medicare is corrupt, and I'm telling you right now, my medical records are fraudulent, <laughs> and I'm not taking it anymore. I'm sorry to hear that, sir. Well, I, I hear a lot of words, but this is my experience. The nursing homes, they treat me terribly, terribly. Just an example, AARP, they reported that there's 400 nursing homes in Pennsylvania under violation. We got tons of them. I spent 18 days in a nursing home, totally abused. And all the organizations you're talking about, elderly care and all this, not one of them will help me. Not one. Well, this is part of representation, and I'm not being represented. I can't falsify medical records. How can you do that and get away with it? Yeah, okay, okay, I'm sorry. Okay. I, I'm 
sorry, I interrupted. I'm sorry, man. That's okay. But I'm telling you, I swear to God, it's the truth. So I'll help you go. It's the truth. Well, thank you for sharing your story. So I, I think that one of the important things that we can see here at the master plan is, is just the way that we can start to bring public and private partnership together. And I think that's what has allowed, has allowed us to pivot. That's what has allowed when COVID hit and we were already really well into the master plan that we were actually able to respond faster because everyone was already in the room, right? We were already talking together. We already knew who the players were. And I think that, um, happened with great leadership, but I also think what that did was it happened with our common goals. And I think there was a common language. I think that there has just been um, an ability and, and a willingness to work together. And so I think the master plan, um, it's an opportunity for us to work together, but I think what it does is it brings together community engagement. And I think what we need to do is to make sure everyone is represented. This is about equity, this is about access, and this is the way that we can not only look at those five bold goals, but we don't have to boil the ocean. We can look specifically at what do we do best, and if I do this best, what do you do best, and how do we bring that to the table? And, and so I think that as we start to look at these convenings, we start to have these regular meetings, we start to say, okay, well, what is the true need with food insecurity? I know we've had a lot of conversations with Meals on Wheels and exponentially they've had to do so much more because of COVID and they've done an incredible job at helping people get access to food. But as you start to look at that, you think, okay, well, if there's ac food, food access issues, is there transportation issues? And the fact that people aren't being able to get together for congregate meals, does that now create social isolation? And you continue to pull away those layers and, and you start to say, okay, all of these issues are started to they're connected, they're interrelated. And, and we need to make sure that though we're not trying to boil the ocean, that things aren't overlooked. I think those five old goals are great. And I think that's why you see there's over a hundred different initiatives in there because there's just so much to tackle. And the only way we can tackle it is by doing it together. And so something I also want to say is that, you know, what we've been doing here in Orange County is we've tackled the data project. Um, through the Orange County Strategic Plan for Aging, um, the leadership circle came together and said, hey, let's start to identify some needs that we can tackle now. And so we identified food insecurity, technology, and social isolation, also with a lens of, of caregiving and people living with disabilities. And we said, okay, now how do we address that? And, and what's the data? What's out there? What's maybe not out there? And I think as we've been doing this this last year in a pandemic, which has been interesting, we're starting to realize there's a ton out there, but not everything speaks to each other and not everything communicates. And what may be done at one organization is done completely different at another organization, and, and which is all really great. But again, how do we start to work together to make sure that nothing is overlooked, that everything is being addressed? And, and so it's, it's data, 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 but it's not only that data, it's what do we do with that data? And how do we start to identify the real true needs and to say, what is your story? Because it's not just about the data, it's also about the people behind that data to make sure that everyone is so well represented. And you know, I'm sure you've all heard this, but if you've seen one county, you've seen one county. <laughs> one county, um, doesn't mean that you can take that and replicate it somewhere else, which is why I think the master plan is a plan and it's a blueprint. But um, like that blueprint, you're gonna be able to make some changes to that blueprint to adjust to your specific needs as maybe a city or an organization or a county. Because our needs here in Orange County are probably much different than the needs in another county like LA or Solano or wherever that may be. Um, and so I think that, again, is, is allowing us to address specific needs, but it's also our opportunity. We've seen organizations, as, as you heard in my bio, I work with Aging 2.0, and we've got over 130 chapters worldwide. And what we do is bring everyone in the room to say, how do we start to address needs, but how do we bring in technology? How do we address things like the digital divide? And, and what do we need to bring to the table to address those needs, but also, again, is it something that needs some funding? Is it something that needs some people? Is it something that needs some resource? 
I know another organization I've worked with, California Health Medical Reserve Corps, and um, again, example of a great public-private partnership is they've partnered with Microsoft and Amazon to say, okay, how do we get vaccinations and how do we get access to those vaccinations out with the farm workers or you know, in places that maybe are a little hesitant and do we need to stand up a call center? Sure, let's do it. And do we need to you know, bring technology to the table? Sure, let's do it. We've seen that in Solano County and there's been a great partnership and you're seeing great success. And now you're seeing like action. And I think that's what we need to remember about this master plan and even here locally, that as we start to look at this master plan, we start writing this master plan, all really great, but we need to make sure it's met with action. We need to make sure it's not just a plan, but that there's an actual implementation because it starts to create that California for all. And if I dare say an Orange County for all, we want people to stay here. We want people to feel invested. We want them to feel like this is their county and they don't have to be run out because they can't afford it or because there's not housing or there's not access to those resources. So how do we make sure that we start partnering together and continuing that partnership? And so through the master plan, I think that we can bring together meaningful collaboration. We've already seen that, which has been really incredible at both the state level, but also a local level and, and partnerships that move the needle. But also, I think as we look at designing this, that we'd start to design with the community and not for them. I think that's one of the most important things that I, I want to impart here today is we're not just designing it for our community members. I'll say it again, we're designing it with them. We want everyone to be at the table as we're designing for older adults. The older adults need to be part of that conversation. If we're bringing technology, then we need to make sure that the technology, the training, the access, everything is there and, and that we're designing this together. Um, we're designing with it a lens of equity, diversity, inclusion, and, and making sure that this is accessible. And so I think as we move from, from crisis response uh, with COVID and, and even in just creating this master plan, um, my hope, and I, I think probably all of our hope, is that we're starting to move to community resilience. That we can say that we are resilient, but also that we have a sense of preparedness so that as we enter and transition into these different stages, that we can do it well. Um, we can do it without this burnout. We can do it without this fear and, and even without this um, mindset of anti-aging. That makes me cringe when I hear anti-aging and I purposely don't buy anything that says anti-aging because I'm not against aging. <laughs> I actually think aging is beautiful and I think this process is what's the common thread for all of us because we're all aging. We all have a story. And, and as we think of that, it's we want to have um, aging be something really revered, but also that, that aging with aging comes experience. Right? It comes with great stories. And, and as I mentioned, my, my grandparents, it, it's something that you want to honor. And I think the best way we can honor our older adults is to do that through an incredible master plan for aging here in the state of California. But um, would love to see that we do that here well in Orange County. So I thank you all so much for your time and look forward to the partnership with each of you and making sure we're all at the table and we're all really well represented. So thank you. Thank you so much, yeah. Ellen. Mm -hmm. Thank you so very much. And of course, I now realize I've misplaced my glasses. Mm -hmm. Well, we were just talking about aging, weren't we? There you go. Well, th those will work. Here, yeah, that, that'll work. Thank you. Ah, these won't work. All right. <laughs> Nonetheless, there we go. That was the one. Sorry. I don't know when your eyesight went bad. Mine was about two years ago. I will not say my age. Well, anyways, Ellen, thank you very much for those, uh, for all those um, information and such. Um, Erica Danzak, she is the director of the Orange County Office on Aging and Veteran Services. In this role, Erica's, Erica is responsible for overseeing county, state, and federal programs for older adults. Caregivers, caregivers and persons with disabilities, as well as leading a team of accredited veterans claims officers who assist veterans and military families with access to VA benefits. 
Erica has over 15 years of county management experience leading programs for vulnerable populations, including older, adu older adults, caregivers, persons with disabilities, veterans, and families in poverty. Erica earned her bachelor's degree in psychology from Loyola Marymount University and a master's degree in gerontology from the California State University, Long Beach. Go Beach. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Erica. Hi everyone, good morning. Thank you, thank you for saying good morning back. <laughs> thank you for the opportunity to represent Orange County at this important community event. And especially thank you to the city of Irvine and the Lakeview Senior Center for giving me a reason to put on real high heels this morning. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> Those Zoom meetings make it all too tempting to leave your slippers on. So today, today is a special day. Um, as mentioned, I am with the Orange County Office on Aging, and also here with me today are our other county leaders that are involved with aging programs. We have representatives from OC Community Resources, the Social Services Agency, as well as our county executive office. And you've already heard this morning the important messages from our Orange County Board of Supervisors. I also know that we have members of our Senior Citizen Advisory Council. I see one of them here today. Hi, Carolyn. But many of them are tuning in virtually this morning, and so shout out to them wherever they are. My portion of today's presentation is to go over the local playbook with which accompanies the state's master plan for aging. We heard the overview of the master plan from Amanda Lawrence at the California Department of Aging, who went over the five bold goals and all the different strategies that support each of those goals, as well as the over 130 action-oriented initiatives um, that we get to work on together over the next two years. And then the last couple components are the data dashboard, which we were able to preview a little bit this morning, and then, of course, the local playbook. So I am so thankful, we are so thankful for the local playbook because that's a lot. When you think about all that's gone into the master plan, the local playbook is a welcome tool for us to help break down things into more manageable pieces. It is designed to assist local government, community, private, and philanthropic organizations in building an age-friendly environment. The playbook has seven plays, which I'll go over. And each play that I'll talk about, I will discuss what the county's already working on, what we think is working well, some of our successes, and also where we think we have some opportunities. For anyone interested in the full playbook, it's available online at aging.ca.gov. Okay, so let's get into it. Play number one, engage local leaders. This play focuses on the importance of having the right leaders at the table for successful implementation of projects, policies, and initiatives. It emphasizes collaboration and cross-sector partners. In Orange County, we are very fortunate. We have an extensive aging network. You heard from Ellen, who represents our Orange County Strategic Plan for Aging. Huge member council there. Um, we also, underneath that, have the Orange County Aging Services Collaborative made up of boots in the, on the ground organizations that are actually doing the work in our communities. We are also a designated Aging and Disability Resource Center in California. They too have their own advisory board. We also have, like I mentioned, the Senior Citizen Advisory Council, which is a direct arm to our Orange County Board of Supervisors and advocates on behalf of older adults and keeps our board informed in all things aging matters. So we know that we have uh, a plan to uh, and a commitment from all of our stakeholders. Um, we've already seen some of the work in action. SCAC, our, our advisory council, they have gone so far as to renaming all of their standing committees to align with each of the five goals in the master plan. Um, so there's a lot of enthusiasm, and we are excited to be able to build upon that. Our challenge, really, as a large county, with all of this 
uh, enthusiasm and multiple stakeholders will be to channel some of that energy into focusing on our master plan so that everyone is singing from the same sheet of music, so to speak. We've discussed the creation of a master plan for aging steering committee with representatives from each one of those groups that I just mentioned. The county has also tried to get a little bit of a jump start on this by bringing together all the different county departments that provide aging programs in order to strengthen our coordination internally. The other challenge is that we're wanting to bring into uh, our network stakeholders that aren't already plugged in. Not the usual suspects, right? But we know that there are important stakeholders that come in contact with older adults through their work day in and day out that have a voice and should have a voice at that same table. Okay, moving on to play number two, explore local data. Meaningful metrics are the foundation for planning and evaluation of our work. There are several publicly available data sets that help in some areas, but the reality is, is that every organization, every service, every program collects and reports on their own data. Our local data is quite fragmented. Orange County had the opportunity to preview the, the data dashboard through the master plan uh, prior to today. And we know that it will become a very important tool for planning purposes once it's fully populated. Um, our first impressions were, wow, this is wonderful that this exists because it's something that we've never had before. But there's a lot of placeholders on the data dashboard for things that haven't even yet to be collected. Um, but it is a goal of the state to start tapping into some of those data elements to bring it up into that platform. The other piece of data that has been very eye-opening is our COVID response data. It's been extremely eye-opening to the needs of older adults at a time of crisis. Nutrition alone has seen over a 50% increase in demand of services compared to pre-COVID serving levels, and it has stayed that way since March 2020. In total, depending on the program, depending on the month or the week, we have seen on average an increase of 30 to 50% in all of our area agency on aging programs. So we're now almost 18 months or over 18 months into this, realizing that this is probably our new baseline. I, I don't know that we're going to revert back to those numbers that we saw before March 2020. And so we have to plan for that new increased demand as though it is the new normal. Our challenge will be to provide person-centered person services using multidisciplinary approaches when aging data systems do not talk to each other, and Ellen mentioned that. We also have confidentiality laws that preclude caseworkers and agencies with common clients from, from trying to help older adults from sharing information in order to better serve the client. So I think that we have some opportunity to influence this through legislation, through policy making, because we need to have a mechanism to be able to work together. If we're talking about the spirit of collaboration and transitioning to person-centered services, those that work with this population need to be able to share data and talk to each other for the better of the client. Okay, moving on to play number three. Review local aging friendly models. Success, successful age friendly models and projects have been implemented around the world. And it's important that we become familiar with other models so that as we learn about our own community, we can understand which ones might be most appropriate for Orange County. As the local area agency on aging, we prepare an area plan report for the state every four years. And that outlines all of our priorities, our goals, our objectives, our programs of focus. And it is developed with community input. We do focus groups, we do surveys, um, we develop goals and objectives. It is based on the feedback from that community input, but the other half of um, what drives that area plan and what's possible is the funding. 
The master plan for aging will provide us with an opportunity to expand on the area plan to not just include the programs that fall under the Area Agency on Aging, but all county programs, including adult protective services, in-home support services, behavioral health services, public health services, et cetera. As we expand, it will be of interest to learn more about dementia-friendly plans, as well as models in areas that are similar to Orange County, similar in size with similar demographics, in terms of diversity, economics, and cultural considerations. Moving on to play number four. Select your master plan for aging initiatives. This has been challenging because we have been in crisis mode at the same time that the state is rolling out the master plan, right? So I don't think that we can talk about play number four without addressing some of Orange County's response to COVID in terms of our older adult population. The impact of this pandemic has been overwhelming on aging programs, and it has highlighted the importance of providing meaningful programs that address complex needs in a timely manner. We have been unable to really select and pick and choose the initiatives that we would like to focus on because the crisis has almost acted as though it's a mirror image reflecting back to us what our community needs. And so we have been able to implement emergency programs with a lot of flexibility with emergency funding to be able to participate in things like the Great Plates Delivered program that provided over 10,000 Orange County older adults with reliable, consistent deliveries of restaurant meals so that they could stay safe at home. Orange County was one of the first ones to opt into that program, and we partnered with our nutrition providers, Meals on Wheels Orange County, AgeWell Senior Services, and over 50 food providers, caterers, restaurants, small, uh, mom and pop restaurants to provide those uh, meals to the community when they needed it most. We also participated in helping to get seniors vaccinated. When the vaccine was available, older adults were one of the first groups that were eligible to receive the vaccine. And so the county partnered with our healthcare agency, our transportation partners, to bring the vaccine where older adults were. We set up mobile pods in various senior centers throughout the county, community centers. Uh, we created uh, ADA lines at the super pods at Disneyland so that our transportation providers could bring older adults and people with disabilities um, through a different access to be able to get them vaccinated right away. So um, that was a very important project. The other thing that uh, Supervisor Foley touched on is focusing on bridging the digital divide and social isolation, certainly called out in the master plan, but at a time when our world is, has never been more reliant on technology, we know that that is uh, so important that everyone has reliable access, including older adults. The county invested over $2.4 million in uh, American Rescue Plan Act funds for a senior technology program that is providing not only the iPads with the data plans, but access to individual training so that older adults can learn how to use these devices to connect with their, uh, their doctors, their healthcare workers, their families, their friends. And this service also provides an online learning platform through a company called Get Set Up and they are specifically geared toward older adult learning for seniors by seniors. So seniors, whether you've got one of the iPads or not, if you have your own device or laptop, you can tap into our Orange County subscription and take classes of interest, things like cooking and sharing recipes or gardening or pets um, or even more academic-based classes like uh, how to brush up on your Excel skills or Zoom 101. So I encourage everyone to take a look at that. We also know and we've heard a couple of times this morning about food insecurity and how important senior nutrition is. 
And uh, after the Great Plates program sunsetted, our Board of Supervisors authorized $15 million in total. The first round was uh, CARES Act funding. The second round was American Rescue P Plan Act funding uh, for nutrition gap programs. And that was to continue to provide meal services, home delivered meals through uh, contracts with various food providers to make sure that we didn't have any senior go hungry and that no one was falling through those gaps. Understanding our local data will drive our priority areas. That's another um, tool that we'll use to help identify which areas Orange County wants to work on. We need to look at the data. It's not a one size fits all. Initiatives that address diverse aging population, some services are prioritized uh, by seniors because of the pandemic, but we know that those services we had to be very creative with how we were implementing them. Many of those services were happening down to the neighborhood level. And so we wanna make sure that we're not losing some of those lessons learned long after COVID, that some of the things that went well and the lessons that we learned, we wanna hold on to as we start to identify which initiatives we wanna focus on first, second, third, um, and how we want to implement them. The last thing I wanted to say about play number four is that, and Amanda alluded, alluded to it earlier, we are seeing historic investments in aging programs, uh, funding that we have never seen before for older adult programs. The emergency funding that we received for Older Americans Act programs came with a lot of flexibility. So we could really see the need, meet the need, and it happened that quickly. The funding that is planned for uh, aging programs, it's highly prescriptive. They're earmarked for certain programs that won't allow us to have as much flexibility. So it will be our job to um, figure out where the gray is and to uh, be creative with the funding that is given to us so that we can make sure that it's meeting the unique needs of Orange County. How's my pace, okay? I got a thumbs up from the back. <laughs> All right, moving on to play number five. Build your action plan. Clarify, I just wanna clarify that nothing has been developed yet. Today marks an important kickoff day in terms of community awareness and stakeholder engagement. Our action plan will continue with community engagement so that projects are based on speci specific needs and provide a clear scope with goals, objectives, strategies, and evaluation measures. Our challenge is that we are a large county and aging is a stage of life. It's not a social problem. It's not once we solve this, then we can move on to the next thing. It is a stage of life and it's here to stay. It's the longest stage of life. So we need to ensure that our actions address the entire stage of life from the young old to the old old, right? Those of us in, in the field know what I'm talking about. What we design for a 60 year old that still may be in the workforce, very active volunteer work, um, you know, is doing the Zoom classes at the senior center, it may not be what's appropriate for the 90 year old that's you know starting to slow down, become frail, become more homebound, and every, everything in between. We need to replicate today's event, I, I would think, on a much more regional scale because Orange County is so large and so diverse and our community needs are so different. We may take this, this show on the road, right? Replicate it in a more regional approach where we're working with cities whose needs are all different. Community-based organizations who are actually in the communities doing the work and understand the unique needs of this population. Okay, play number six. Evaluate your age-friendly program. Research and program evaluation will be part of every phase of, de of the development process. Our Board of Supervisors are very big on performance outcomes and making 
decisions based on data. We anticipate some evidence-based or evidence-informed requirements for various programs, such as disease prevention, um, and we know that those are designed based on an already established framework, so it's not something that we suspect we'll have to reinvent the wheel on, but if we do have flexibility, we will definitely design our own evaluation framework so that we can monitor progress and make adjustments as we go. Our challenge will be just that. We need to be able to uh, evaluate and stay nimble be build in a lot of flexibility so that we can make adjustments as we go and ensure that we're not locked into anything. All right, last play. Play number seven, stay connected. We learn from others' experiences. Our county leaders have been participating in all the workshops and information sessions offered by the state so that we can learn and understand their vision but we also can connect with our counterparts in other counties to hear what they're working on and to share what it is that we're working on. Our county departments have gotten together and we've gone through, I think, a very valuable exercise in doing a service inventory mapping of all the different services that are offered through the county, and we actually mapped those to each of the Master Plan for Aging goals. It helped us to see, again, what's working well, because uh, like Ellen mentioned, Orange County is ahead of the game in many aspects. So it was very gratifying to see that at least one of our programs, more times it was multiple programs, covered uh, at least one of the five bold goals. Um, it was also very eye-opening to us that um, we, we need to do a better job of connecting internally because if in such a large county we have aging programs that cross multiple departments, we can only imagine the level of frustration it must be for our customers, our older adults themselves, or caregivers that are already stressed and trying to access information about what services are available for their family members while they're tr quickly trying to call on a lunch break um, because they themselves are holding down a full-time job and also caring for their school-age children at home. So we understand that um, creating a single point of entry that is uh, seamless and highly visible for the community is important. Uh, we have pieces of that in place, so I think we have the right ingredients to make that successful, but we definitely have some work to do in that area. The last thing I wanted to say in closing is sort of what Supervisor Wagner touched on. I'll close by saying that the growth rate of the aging population in Orange County is outpacing the nation and the state in terms of percentage of increase. The 60 and older population in Orange County is nearly 700,000 people, and that number is expected to grow by almost 50% over the next 10 years. Not only are we growing larger, but we're also living longer, and that means that we need to consider initiatives that are dementia-friendly models because unfortunately, as people live longer, the rates of Alzheimer's disease and other dementias are only going to become more prevalent. I heard a quote from one of my colleagues who was reading the other day that the average fourth grader today is expected to live to the age of 112. That's unbelievable. Even with uh, our, our uh, longevity getting hit by COVID, I think it's about a year and a half is what I read, for those children that are in grade school today, the average fourth grader will live until they're 112 years old. So isn't that unbelievable? So it's, it's our challenge to implement cross-sector initiatives to ensure that Orange County is age-friendly and the best place to age in America so that our fourth graders will want to grow old here. <laughs> Thank you all for having me. Thank you very much, Erica. You'll be hearing from her in the uh, discussion as well. 
as somebody who volunteered at the uh, Disney's uh, vaccination, um, uh, that was a very seamless with, with all the ADA. It was fantastic. Um, I want to thank all the uh, speakers today that spoke on the Master Plan for Aging. Now it's going to be time to hear from our elected officials, but in the meantime, we are going to take a, a quick break. As a reminder, if you have a question, you are more than welcome to put that into the Q&A in the, uh, either at the kiosk at the se whatever senior center you're at, or if you're watching virtually at home, you're welcome to put that in the Q&A as well. So with that being said, we are going to take a little bit of a break. Uh, we'll see you back here in just a few minutes. Thank you. Welcome back to Mastering the Master Plan. If you're just joining us, my name is Steve Shanahan. I have the honor of uh, being the former mayor and city council member for the city of La Palma. I also have been your moderator. Now let's get right to the wonderful elected officials that want to hear from you. First off, we want to um, acknowledge and thank Senator Umberg from the 34th District. <laughs> Senator Min from the 37th District. <laughs> Assemblymember Quirk Silva from the 65th District. <laughs> and you heard from Erica before, but the, the Director of Orange County Office of Aging and Veterans Services Office, Erica Danzek. All right, let's get into this. All right, so what this is going to be, we're going to have uh, um, the, we have some pre-designed questions that we wanted to ask, and we're going to allow the elected officials and the and the experts to kind of weigh in when it uh, when it becomes a, a applicable. A major obstacle for aging adults is transportation. So let's talk about transportation issues and solutions for our community as we age with the goal of providing essential transportation options to accommodate the greatest number of older adults. Transportation, transportation to and from medical appointments to senior centers and activities is critical. What are OC cities doing? What is the county doing? And what is planned to enhance transportation that is ADA compliant, appropriate for those who are hearing or visually impaired? What supports are, are available for non-English speaking older adults who need assistance with transportation. Who wants to jump in? Assemblywoman Quirk Silva. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. I think, you know, as I walked in, we heard some of the facts from my partner right here about 700,000 aging uh, individuals in Orange County and possibly doubling that in the future. And as we think about transportation, we know that Orange County has invested with Measure M, uh, and a small part of that does go to our aging individuals. That, that's a good start, but certainly it's not enough. I think at the local levels, uh, as city individuals, and you were a council member before, we need to start to look towards walkable communities, active transportation in the sense of all types of forms. We know not everybody's going to jump out a bicycle, certainly uh, also in special age groups, but how do we invest in our communities to get people around? And we need to look at, of course, we have our major transportation systems like OCTA, but smaller uh, types of um, transportation, pool cars, things like that. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Nimin. Thank you, Steve. Um, so I have the privilege of representing Irvine as well as Laguna Woods and some other areas. Uh, and what we know in California, and particularly the area I represent, is, is you have some retirement communities, like uh, Laguna Woods obviously has a big one. Uh, but Irvine, many, many elder folks, uh, seniors, are living in their homes, the homes they maybe raise their kids in because of Prop 13 and the tax burdens of moving on. They're, they're in the same house. And, and that means that our senior population is much more dispersed than say it might be the case in Florida or other states. Uh, and so I think it, transportation is obviously critical for that. Uh, and in addition to the stuff that OCTA has been doing with access, and I think you guys are all aware of, of some of the different programs OCTA offers uh, for those who might need transportation, those who might need uh, be hearing impaired or visually impaired. Uh, but I think it's also important, important for us to think about alternatives to just getting in a car or a bus 
uh, you know, like, so should there be golf carts? Uh, in Laguna Woods right now, a lot of the senior population uses golf carts to get around, but they, they're kind of limited because outside of Laguna Woods, many of the surrounding cities uh, don't appreciate them coming in and shopping in their malls for whatever reason. So uh, that may be something we have to think about. Uh, we should also be thinking about alternatives to just you know, driving. And, and so that's something that I know everyone up here is thinking about. Uh, as Orange County gets more dense, uh, we have more people coming in generally, what, what is transportation gonna look like? Uh, I had to drive to Pasadena yesterday, and that's not fun, right? Driving even up to 55 these days is not fun. And if you're a senior, you multiply that by the fact that you may um, not, you may be f feeling a little bit more cautious about driving. Uh, and, and for many seniors, unfortunately, you know, it, it's maybe not appropriate to drive, which is one of the reasons we held a AAA workshop on keeping the keys and what seniors need to do to be able to keep driving. Uh, but there's, it's a multifaceted problem. It's something that uh, is going to require a lot of planning. And, and uh, I'd love to hear from you all, but also work with OCTA to figure out what we can do going forward. Senator Emmerk. Well, well, thank you, Steve. Um, and, and thank you all for organizing this today. Really important. Um, all of us are going to be in the same category at some point in time. When I was first elected 30 years ago, I thought new and fresh ideas by young people were the most important contribution to government. Now I think it's experience uh, and, and, and a little bit of, a little bit of uh, maturity. So in terms of transportation, we need to think ahead. What transportation is going to be like for seniors 10 years from now when we have self-driving cars, when we have the ability to innovate in ways that we probably haven't thought of today. And, and we all, you all, need to be part of that solution. We've got some infrastructure in place, but connectivity is a challenge. Our district office is at the Santa Ana train station, the regional transportation center. We have buses and we have the trains and Metrolink that all connect there. But we don't have complete connectivity to all the other resources in Orange County. And so one of our challenges, our collective challenge, is, is figuring out how we combine and connect all these resources in a way that's most efficient for seniors. And your input is critical in that endeavor. Thank you. Thank you. Erica. Not much more to add. I just would like to share that the county has partnered with the Orange County Transportation Authority to provide various transportation options for seniors, um, including the Senior Non-Emergency Medical Transportation Program that is funded with tobacco settlement revenue and Measure M2 dollars. Um, we also partner with all the cities. Uh, virtually every city in Orange County has a senior mobility program. Many of the cities use those dollars to augment senior nutrition programs so that the seniors can have transportation to come to the senior center, participate in congregate lunch programs, and so forth. Um, in addition, you know, there's OCTA access. Um, all of them either have a very small charge or a su suggested donation, and of course, those fees or donations can be waived for those that are very low income um, but still need access to transportation. But one, one of the things I would like to just recommend, and this is what we, we talk to the community about when they're trying to access our call center for information on transportation resources, is the key is to not wait until you've had a driver's license revoked. That's not the time to start researching what transportation options are available to you in your community. Don't wait until a parent has a diagnosis that's going to prevent them from driving. Um, unlike other major metropolitan areas, Orange County doesn't have a mass transit system, so we rely on our cars. So start your research earlier rather than later. Um, a good way to just learn about what's available is to contact the Office on Aging. Our information and referral call center is 800-510-2020. And also 211 Orange County is another great access to learn about transportation resources. Do it now before a driver's license is taken away. Great advice, thank you. Moving on, how will the local master plan for aging implementation ensure that emergency transportation free or low cost is more accessible to seniors? Is there a plan or current procedures in place to train drivers in these programs to assist older adults who have mobility challenges or who are more vulnerable due to chronic health conditions? And I know, Director Danz, like you kind of touched on that a little bit, but um, did anybody else have any thoughts on that? Senator Min, go ahead. I'd only add, um, 
that uh, in the budget this year we, we had a one-time grant of $100 million to Cal OES to uh, create an all-hazards grant program specifically for this type of purpose, um, providing assistance to communities who might uh, need help in these types of areas. Uh, and the governor did appoint a senior advisor on aging, disability, and Alzheimer's, Kimberly McCoy, and I know this is a top priority of hers. I think the only thing I'd add is, you know, when we create policy or budgets for 40 million people, the key is making sure we have the follow through at the local level. So what the county is doing is so, so important uh, because we can direct money, but if it's not being utilized in the right ways, uh, we're not going to have an effective transportation program for seniors who really need it. Uh, and I think we all agree up here that, you know, having access to transportation during health emergencies is critical. Um, and it's not something that, you know, seniors need to check, like, can I afford this or not? Uh, and the last thing I'd say is that information is important. We need to make sure that people know about this, and I think this builds on Erica's point. And so we, we, I think, at the state level could do a better job of funding some of the branding and marketing around some of the programs that are available to seniors and other communities. Senator Emberg? Let me just follow on Senator Min's point. Um, one of the challenges we have with seniors is that we assume uh, I think in government that virtually everybody has access to internet and everybody is facile with, with being able to access that information. That's not quite the case. And so we need to do a better job. We need to do a better job of communicating to seniors and their caregivers um, about transportation resources um, and plan ahead, uh, as was mentioned a little while ago, and plan ahead for when we're seniors. Okay. Oh, you good? All right. Thank you. Another growing concern in our communities is access to quality, affordable care designed for aging adults. Most Medicare doesn't cover some of these things. So how are we currently providing access to affordable or no cost care that is specific to the needs of the aging community? Assemblywoman Silva. You know, I have been a classroom teacher for 30 years, and I have to do this little shout out. This young guy over here, Tim Kelsey, who just came to say hello to me, was in my first classroom when I was 22 years old, and now he is 40, working at Seal Beach. So that is a, quite a surprise. But I really believe that many of our issues that we have to address today for the future are going to start with preventative. Uh, as we know, some of the chronic illnesses that are really hit hard by some of our Latino uh, communities, people of color, are uh, preventable, whether it's diabetes, whether it's heart conditions. We saw a huge impact with COVID uh, and how those communities really had some very, very poor results. So if we could start at the local and state county really looking at how are we working towards uh, preventing these chronic uh, diseases, whether it's healthy or school lunches, whether it's really starting to talk about alternative care, and I'll be the first, some people have asked what happened. A lot of these things are you're not taking care of what you need to take care of at the time, and as the senator just said, don't wait, because once you do, uh, it gets much worse, and as far as affordability in the healthcare system, we know that it's much uh, less impact on our, our dollars when we do preventative versus uh, intensive care. Senator Min. Thanks, Steve. Um, I, I, I would echo uh, the Assemblywoman's comments. I'd also add, you know, I think building on what I said earlier, California is unique in that we have a senior population that is very dispersed. We're not concentrated in homes or in communities for the most part. Uh, many of our seniors, my parents live in the same home I grew up in. And that's true for many elderly folks around the state. And, and that creates challenges when it comes to supportive care. Uh, and so when we think about the landscape of healthcare in this state for seniors, I think in-home supportive services has to be a key plank. And it's something that historically the state has underfunded and underemphasized. So uh, this is something that, you know, I think a number of us have been fighting to try to expand funding for, because at the end of the day, um, you know, for our senior population, a lot of this is around, do you have access to someone who can come and, and help you out on, on a basic medical needs, uh, healthcare needs? Uh, it's not so much about going to the hospital, but, but having on-site care. And, uh, that's costly, potentially, but, but we need to do it. And the fact that there's not enough caregivers signals that we're not really providing enough funding for this program. Senator Dunberg? Um, thank you. 
Several issues. Um, I'm 66 years old, so I've hit that magic age of 65 when you become eligible, and in fact, it becomes somewhat mandatory that you enroll in Medicare. Unbelievably challenging and difficult. So number one is providing assistance so that folks can do so uh, knowledgeably. They're not penalized if, for example, they think they're insured, turns out not to be insured, and then they get penalized. Num number two is that there's a misconception that somehow Medicare I had that misconception. Somehow Medicare takes care of everything. It does not. You know that. Now I know that. Um, and that the importance of providing some supplement, whether it's funded by the government, I'm fortunate, I have, uh, I'm covered by the VA as well, or, or, or other means. And then number three is that, um, as Senator Min points out, we have a dispersed population here. And many, many seniors require um, in-home care. Sadly, we'll pay for in-home care if it's provided by someone else. We won't pay if it's provided by a relative. And that makes really no sense. Um, all of us, when we're seniors, we, we would much prefer someone who we know and love and someone who loves us to provide that care. But it, it is a financial burden if that person is, is going to have to leave their job to provide that kind of care. And so we, as a government, state government, federal government, uh, need to make sure that, that in-home access to health care can be provided by a family member just as it could be provided by an outside resource. Director Denzik? I would just like to add that, you know, I, I think it's important for us to take responsibility for the pieces that uh, we're responsible for. So for the county, um, we provide access to apply for benefits for clients that are eligible to receive those services. Um, they can apply for Medi-Cal benefits. Uh, One Care through CalOptima provides the Medicare and Medi-Cal benefit. Um, so we can definitely help them as an access point to applying for those benefits. But we're, we're not the operators of those services. So it's important that we bring into the conversation uh, partners like CalOptima or other health plans to be able to work together to provide those home and community-based services because much of the master plan talks about the bridge between health care and home care. So how can we bring those services in the home um, so that people can age in place? Thank you. Um, Senator Umberg just talked briefly about the, you know, the, the long-term care. So long-term care costs are, are prohibitively expensive and are rarely covered by the insurance, except for some adults who meet the clinical and financial criteria, criteria for Medi-Cal to cover placement in skilled nursing facilities, which is often not the best care option. The lowest rates paid by Medi-Cal and CalOptima to skilled nursing facilities often create difficulties in finding long-term long care beds in Orange County. The program of the assisted living waiver is cumbersome, inadequate, and has a ridiculously long waiting list. How will the local master plan for aging address this critical and crucial issue of aging and to ensure that Orange County creates access to quality long-term care that doesn't devastate families financially? Well, th this is a statewide challenge. Um, Orange County actually, in many respects, is meeting that, that challenge better than many areas in the state. But as I mentioned a moment ago, providing for in-home care by a relative is, is one way. Also, um, where I think that is, is uh, I age a bit and some of these issues become personal to me, uh, we need to do a better job, employers in particular, I'm also an employer, need to do a better job of explaining how long-term care works and how you can plan ahead for long-term care um, in, in, in your own world either through your employer or on your own, so that when you do need long-term care, you're, you're not hit with a situation that is nearly impossible. As you point out, the list is very long for assisted care, assisted living, um, and the resources um, are available, but they're difficult sometimes to access. And so, um, again, promulgation of information to seniors is another challenge that we haven't quite met, but need to meet. Sure. Some members of Cork Silva? 
And the, the theme about education, meaning that as we started out with talking about if you need transportation, don't wait until uh, you don't pass your eye exam to start to look for alternatives. And it's the same in this situation. As families, we don't always sit down um, as individuals together with either our aging parents or others that might need support and talk about a long-term plan. If you actually look at the health providers, and uh, we I don't want you to raise your hand, but how many of you individually here have actually done your own health directive? And many of us put that on the list to do, but we don't do it. So really planning not only individually, but sitting down with our families and asking uh, what is it that they see and what kind of care would they like? But the other major kind of elephant in the room is even though Orange County is doing a better job with in-home health care, the state and the county like to bounce that responsibility back and forth and no one has really taken full responsibility uh, that this isn't always under duress of who's going to fund it. And when we don't fund these in-home health care workers or pay them the most minimum wage, it is hard to attract people who want to come in uh, to do a very serious and hard work. So we have to invest in our uh, health care providers that are going to be providing this service for aging patients. Dr. Danzek? Maybe the county should bounce it to the cities. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, but really, I mean, it, it is going to take, if we want to build more um, affordable senior housing that has assisted living or skilled nursing components, we are going to need to leverage those public-private partnerships and working with the cities. Um, much like the homeless population, there's resistance in a lot of communities that people say they want this, but they just don't want it in their neighborhood or their area. Um, and so we need to um, reignite those conversations with the master plan in the background as a reason why this is really important. Um, but much of the focus of the master plan has been on long-term services and supports, which is really the premise of the Older Americans Act programs. And that is to provide support and care for people to remain independent for as long as possible. So uh, where family members may say, uh, my, my mom broke a hip and now she can't drive, I need to put her into a nursing home. Call us because there are like 20 different other options besides just going straight to that, but you don't know what you don't know until you need it. So if we set mom up with home delivered meals, in-home assistance, someone to come in and help her with housework and chores, um, the transportation so that she can get to and from her doctors. All of these sort of wraparound services that we talk about in child welfare now also apply to older adult services because I'm sure mom's preference is to be able to stay and remain in our own home rather than go into a nursing home. I agree, the question started out, skilled nursing is not always the best option. 100% agree, it's not always the best option. Senator Emmerich? Um, of course, the pandemic has exacerbated all these challenges. I just learned yesterday from my spouse that we have eight veterans homes here in California, and they're not basically admitting anyone since the pandemic because they're concerned about the spread of COVID. There are ways to uh, mitigate and e even contain that. I don't know if that's happening in skilled nursing care facilities and assisted, um, uh, assisted care facilities here in Orange County, but I know at least in certain sectors of our um, health care providers that, that this has become now a really acute issue because you can't get in. If you um, are a senior in need, you, you simply can't get in. And that's something, again, that, that we're going to address. I'm going to at least address it with respect to the veterans homes. And I assume that other members of the legislature uh, maybe including me, will address it with respect to, to skilled nursing care facilities. We, we simply can't draw up the bridge and say no one will be admitted during the course of this pandemic. I, I would say that it's probably a very difficult conversation to, to start to have, similar to uh, having life insurance or creating an estate or a will, the long-term long -term care options with the family is a, uh, probably not an easy discussion uh, for people to have. 
Um, moving into uh, cultural and a little bit of a ethnically diverse, as Orange County is more culturally and ethnically diverse, what are the current policies and supports to ensure that aging adults at all uh, cultural backgrounds have access to quality health care that is culturally competent in their native language? And how will the lo local master plan for aging address this growing need? Senator Min. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, and I, you know, as someone who represents over so the cities I represent are Irvine, Laguna Beach, Laguna Woods, Newport, Tustin, Villa Park, Orange, Anaheim Hills, Lake Forest, and some others. Uh, it's an incredibly diverse area. Irvine, as we know, is very diverse. We have a, a pretty significant uh, aging population that it is uh, non-English, or English is not necessarily their first language. Uh, and that's true across this district. Uh, and I think it starts with recognizing that we do need culturally competent care and outreach. I, I think recognizing that is first and foremost uh, on the agenda, uh, but then it's also following through. So uh, you, many of you may have seen that we passed an API, an Asian Pacific Islander equity budget this year, and a good chunk of that money is actually going to federally qualified health centers. That's the design of it, uh, to try to reach out on uh, Asian education, but certainly part of that's going to be access to health care. And, and I think we need to keep supporting these types of community organizations that have the specialization, that have the community relationships, whether it's in Senator Umberg's district or Assemblywoman Cork Silva's district or my district, uh, because that I think is, is easier than just kind of dictating it from the top down. But at the same time, I think the state really needs to emphasize that, you know, for, particularly for a lot of uh, seniors, it's, it is important that, that we have is in language type outreach because uh, I think sometimes the state forgets that. And so earlier this year, you may have read that the DMV, and this is a little bit of an aside, planned to cancel 25 different written language tests. That would have been devastating for a number of communities, including anyone who spoke Hindu, Korean, uh, I think Vietnamese, a whole bunch of different languages would have happened. And so a number of us stood up and, and talked to the governor and said, this is not appropriate. What you're gonna do is deny access to driving for huge swaths of our population. And the governor responded overnight and the DMV reversed that the next day. But again, this is the type of incident that too often happens if we're not thinking about the importance of in language, culturally competent outreach, whether in healthcare or anything else. Senator Umber, sorry. Well, I was going to be optimistic here that one thing that did ha happen during the pandemic is uh, a lot more of our health professionals started to uh, use telehealth. And there are many, many now telehealth appointments. But when you look at language, uh, it is very difficult for health systems to say to have an interpreter that's Korean, Chinese, all of the different languages that could be needed at any one health space. But now many of our health institutions are actually zooming them in uh, for the conversation with the doctor. So whether it's person to person, face to face, the patient and the doctor is there together and they zoom in the interpreter or it's all on Zoom, this is giving more access for that language. And as you know, uh, if there's just communicating individually, uh, if it's you're from a second language is difficult, but when you start to talk into health uh, dialogue or terminology, that's even more difficult. So it really is imperative that we have interpreters uh, that can help not only the, the patient, but their families understand uh, what's going to happen as far as any health procedures. Senator Umberg. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Assemblymember Quirk. So I was going to mention telehealth. That, that's such an important a lesson we've learned during the pandemic is that we can access healthcare uh, through Zoom, et cetera. Uh, again, there's a challenge with seniors who aren't facile with um, the internet. Uh, second point is, is that we need to start earlier, identifying those uh, populations where we need healthcare professionals and start earlier to encourage young people who are, for example, Vietnamese speakers or or Spanish speakers or other sorts of speakers where we have populations here in California that are underserved to go into STEM, to go into the healthcare field so that we begin to, to mitigate this. And we are beginning to mitigate it, but, but even more so. Thank you. We have a, um, quite a few questions from the audience and those that are virtually. So uh, we're gonna try to get to as many of these can, can in the next few minutes. 
Um, but that being said, let's move to housing, which is a, an incredibly um, important topic. You know, we've had questions on housing, both the cost and availability identified as significant concerns here in California and Orange County specifically. As the cost of both owning and renting rises, what steps are being taken to ensure that members of our communities are not left unprotected? For many, their SSI retirement income does not or and will not support the rapidly growing cost of housing in Orange County. Older adults are at a great risk for homelessness. What will the master plan for aging do to address this critical issue? Sharon, uh, Assemblywoman Sharon Silva. I'm gonna jump out on this one because I'm really passionate about this subject. I mean, if you don't have food and a place to live, those are the two basic needs that we need and water, of course. And we are really failing when we start to look at housing in California. It's not just for our seniors, but it's also for um, many of our lowest wage earners, our middle class, uh, the average home price is about $800,000. So again, we have to start to look creatively what are we doing with our existing homes? Is there a way? Uh, uh, some of you remember the golden, was it the golden girls that all lived together as seniors? But some of those models really are uh, not something that we should take off the table. But our fastest growing homeless population are seniors, they're senior women, and uh, our mobile home parks, the rents continue to rise um, at a faster pace. And this is one of our last affordable um, places to live. So we have to uh, address this quickly, we have to build, and we have to house people. I know that one of the uh, issues that we continue to face is where and how expensive, but it's part of our job to address this and address it quickly. Senator Emberg. Uh, th this is, as was pointed out, a huge challenge. Uh, and it's a huge challenge for seniors in terms of affordable housing. But it's also sort of a psychological and emotional challenge because those of us that have children, we want our children to live nearby and perhaps we've owned our home for 30 or 40 years, uh, but our children, I have three children in their 30s, very difficult to find affordable housing anywhere in Orange County. Other issue is if, if one of your children wants you to live with them, um, can they build an ADU? Can they build uh, what was formerly known as a granny flat? Very, very challenging. And so it's, it's up to the community. That's often a local issue. That's often a local permitting issue as to whether or not we can build ADUs. Now, um, I'll leave um, it for others to discuss what we've done in the legislature in terms of uh, po providing for increased density and those kinds of things. We have this challenge, that, and the only way we're going to meet it, the only way we're going to meet the challenge of affordable housing is to build more housing. It's not, and, and that's the private sector. Public sector can't build its way out, out of this housing crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Min. Uh, I would echo my good colleagues' uh, comments. Uh, we need more housing, and we need housing of all kinds. Uh, I think that's the first and fo foremost of the message. Uh, we need more housing at all income levels. Uh, we need low income housing and very low income housing, which requires deep subsidies typically from the state and federal governments. Uh, but we also need middle class and, and uh, workforce housing. We have a big lack of that as well. Uh, and so the fact that you cannot typically find uh, rental units that are affordable for someone making uh, you know, $100,000 a year here in Orange County is a real problem. Uh, and it's a problem that is not unique to Orange County uh, that we see emulated around the state, whether it's the Bay Area, Los Angeles, Santa Barbara, or so many other parts of the state, where there are jobs, where people want to live, unfortunately, it's very, very expensive. Uh, and that's why I was proud to support the two major housing bills this year in, this, in the state legislature, SB 9 and SB 10, which did allow more lot splitting, more density. They're very controversial bills. And, you know, it's, there was some significant and I thoughtful criticism of these bills. But at the same time, when I look at the landscape, and I'm the new guy, I just got elected last year, um, and I'm learning a lot right now, but when I look at the 50,000 foot perspective of what's happening in the state, housing, the cost of housing, is a, a, an existential threat to our state. It's the number one reason people are leaving. Uh, when we do surveys, it's not taxes, it's not business regulations. Those are problems as well, but it is all about the cost of housing. And so we have to drive that down. It's, by the way, also the number one cause of homelessness in Orange County, in the Bay Area, in Los Angeles, in most counties, 
the reason people become homeless for the first time is because they, they can't afford their rent, they can't afford to fight in place, they end up couch surfing, surfing living in their cars, and it goes down from there. Uh, so I was also proud, by the way, to, to try to work with the city of Tustin to try to get them exemption to the Surplus Lands Act so that they could build out uh, that whole space around the marine base. Uh, and they were going to build 20% affordable housing with 15% of that being very low and low. It got hung up for some procedural reasons. Uh, we're hoping to take it up next year, but that's going to be uh, tens of thousands of units and thousands of affordable, including very low and low income uh, units. But we just need all hands on deck. Uh, and then we need dedicated services. And so I've, I've been visiting, I think, about 10 different models of uh, homeless shelters and services in the community uh, during this recess. And we've learned a lot about some of the integrated models, the non-integrated models, uh, permanent supportive housing, some of the mental health care that accompanies that. Uh, but we need to be creative uh, and, and thoughtful because it's not just about throwing money at the problem, it's about throwing money at it or directing money in a thoughtful and cost-efficient way. But, but this is the number one challenge I think that we're facing as a state or one of them, and, and we need to take action. And, and so it is sad to see what's happening with the senior population and homelessness, but uh, it is unfortunately part of a, a much bigger problem here. Yes, it is, absolutely. Um, all right, we, we're moving on to some questions from um, those that have typed them in or sent them in. Um, Bill asks, uh, financial abuse of older adults and fraud of all kinds, but especially Medicare fraud is a significant issue for many. How will the master plan for aging address these issues and enhance protections against this type of abuse? Senator Number. This, this is a, another huge challenge uh, that can be met in part by education uh, and also by prosecution. Uh, in, in one of my former careers, I was a prosecutor, and I find it to be most despicable those who prey upon seniors um, using all, all sorts of ruses. And sadly, um, Orange County has become a mecca for these kinds of, of scams and these kinds of, of frauds. And so increasing prosecution, uh, increasing, um, increasing the investigatory resources to identify those who are scamming seniors, increasing the jurisdiction, because often it's now by internet, um, and while Orange County has become a magnet for such kinds of scams, um, if they're operating from other states, it's challenging for us sometimes to get jurisdiction, but coordinating with, with federal authorities to uh, stop, mitigate, and prosecute, and punish those who prey upon seniors. I'd like to speak. I'd like to speak. Uh, well, this is the, uh, is, sir, your question was, was asked. Uh, yeah, but it wasn't answered. My medical records are fraudulent. Nobody's doing anything about it. I went into arbitration. Arbitration is corrupt. The judge was paid by Kaiser Permanente. My case was dismissed. They're not arguing that my medical records were fraudulent. No. Sir, they I think you said they deserve to win. Sir, I think that if we can have a conversation and, uh, after. I've been pushed for four I... years. It's unfair. Okay? The city is, I called every agency in the United States that handles things for senior citizens, not one of them would help me. Aid, council on aging, every one of them. Sir, I think we can have this discussion. We can have it. Sir. Know, this is unfair to seniors. The abuse in nursing homes is terrible. And I was a victim of it for 18 days. Thank you. you know, Thank you. Nobody, you. Understand, nobody understands it up to you. Experience it. Okay? Thank you. Sir, sir, may I ask, uh, where do you live? Medicare is corrupt. Sir, sir, where do you, do you live in Irvine? Uh, if you could, so, uh, and was your name Bill? So I, I, I represent Irvine, so if you'd like to talk to my staff, we can look into this afterwards. Um, okay. you know, Thank you. I, I'm serious, and we, we have a very excellent district staff, and, and just respond to that, your, the question, I usually agree, and, and I would have said this to Tom uh, when he was here, but I almost always agree with Tom Umberg. Here I actually part ways a little bit, because I don't think prosecution is enough. Uh, I started my career at the Securities and Exchange Commission, which uh, is the civil prosecutor for securities fraud in this country. Uh, and we knew that when we were enforcing and prosecuting, it was more of a deterrent than anything else. We were catching, it was, it's like playing sharks and minnows. You're maybe catching one out of a hundred people, right? And you're trying to deter others from acting badly. But, but I think what we've learned in the last 20 to 30 years 
is the importance of also setting up important, important and effective consumer protections. Uh, and so the, earlier this year, I learned uh, that PACE is now one of the most um, egregiously abused programs in targeting seniors, the PACE Energy Program, which was designed for good purposes. Uh, but unfortunately, contractors target seniors, and they, they tell them, hey, you can get um, you know, all these home improvements, uh, and you don't have to pay anything. It's free. And what they don't know is that they're actually rolling up a senior lien that is ahead of their taxes, and they could lose their home because of that. Uh, these contractors often abuse this. They, they charge for work that's not performed. Uh, they, they inflate the estimates. They give them improvements that are not needed, like extra solar panels that these seniors don't need. Uh, and, and so we try to pass a bill uh, to crack down on these types of PACE abuses that would have required an upfront audit and a back-end inspection. And unfortunately, the PACE industry was able to get to some of my colleagues and, and convince them to oppose this bill in the Assembly. So it, it got out of the Senate and then got stalled in the Assembly. And so, I, I, like I said, I'm the baby senator. I'm still learning how things work. But we're, we're committed to trying to crack down on some of these abuses. Uh, as far as Medicare fraud uh, and other types of fraud, I'm hopeful that the mini CFPB that we just put into law uh, there's a consumer, we, we created something that is again, essentially going to be responsible for consumer protections, will be affected in pre preventing some of the types of abuses you're seeing. Now, your particular instance, sir, uh, I think gets to some bigger issues, which is access to justice is really hard in this country. People can't afford lawyers, they, can't, they don't feel like they can get a fair shake in court or in, in different types of processes. Many of our civil disputes go to forced arbitration or mediation through contractual clauses that we don't even know about, we don't have any choice about agreeing to them, uh, and they, they often are rigged against us because they're very industry fr friendly. H how do we deal with that? Some of this is honestly above our level, it's federal. Uh, but, but I think at the very least what we can do is try to get better resources out there and, and work with people like you. And so again, uh, I don't know the particulars of your case, sir, uh, but I, I commit to you that we will try to help. Thank you. Well, yeah, but, sorry, we, 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 we'd like to get a couple, uh, you, if you could talk to the staff after. Thank you, sir. Uh, I just wanted to speak on some of the fraud issues. We are all victim of it. It's not just seniors because the scammers out there are about 10 steps ahead of us. Every time we kind of feel like we get our hands uh, around one issue, they find another way. So whether it's uh, calling, aggressively calling you, saying you owe some type of credit card bill that you don't even have a credit card, whether it's um, emails, all of these knocking on your door. I too ran a pay spill and was able to get one out of two, uh, knowing that again, some of the uh, people that knock on doors saying, uh, you know, we can help you get this fixed are actually losing their homes. And that's very egregious. But some of the lesser ones uh, that we all get called about, we, we do put on senior fraud, but again, it goes back to that education of uh, do you have a cell phone that's protected by two-step um, authentication? Uh, are you giving information out uh, via the web that uh, is allowing people to uh, contacting you? Are you picking up unknown numbers. So education, education, not giving birth dates or social security numbers, any of those things on the phone. And my mother's 84 and she says, well, police union keeps calling me for money. And I said, just hang up the phone. So there's a lot of things, again, going back to our own families, our own parents, to continue to echo over and over the same thing. Don't give your phone numbers out. Don't give your birth dates out, your social security numbers. Uh, and we have to just keep working on that because there's always somebody trying to um, scam or fraud you. Absolutely. I don't think it's just, it's not limited to the older aging. It's everybody. I get several calls a day for that I have my IRS, that I owe millions in IRS bills, which may be actually true. We don't know. <laughs> Moving into a question that came from Faye online. Um, is there anything in the master plan to provide affordable legal services for seniors and to have access to substitute decision makers for those who do not have loved ones to perform that service in the event? The individual is no longer able to make those decisions for himself or herself. Director Danzig? No? Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot there. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. 
I'm, I'm happy to respond. Um, yes, I believe it is addressed in the master plan, but long before the master plan, um, the Older Americans Act provides funding for senior legal services. So the Office on Aging through the county has a contract with um, Legal Aid of Southern California, and they provide free and low cost legal services to seniors, um, and, and not just when um, they need an attorney to come in and advocate on a particular case, but also to help them with their estate planning, their advanced directives, even looking into some long-term care options. So another way to access more information about that particular service would be to contact the Office on Aging, that 800-510-2020 number. Okay. Mayor Ellen asks, uh, is climate change being taken into consideration concerning transportation, housing, et cetera? Senator Min. I hope so, because I, I know that our aging population cares so deeply about our future, right? And what we want to leave behind is something better than we found. Uh, so a lot of you have heard me say this quote many times, but I ran on a campaign of uh, I sent around this quote, but it's from the ancient Greeks, a civilization's great when its elders plant trees whose shade they know they will never sit in. And to me, America has lost our way in thinking about those types of long-term investments, and it's one of the reasons we're kind of in a soul-searching crisis at the moment, in my view. Uh, but we've got to get climate crisis un under control. Uh, we're in an emergency. I just read today the salmon in the Sacramento River are dying. Two percent have survived. Uh, we're, we're facing extinctions on mass level. We're facing 10 degrees Fahrenheit average increase in temperature if we do nothing today. So we've got to act with urgency. Uh, and that starts, the, the earlier we get to start on this, the more effective it's going to be. Uh, so at the state legislature, we could go through a whole bunch of different things that we're doing. Uh, but we're taking steps to try to meet those ambitious climate mandates we have. Uh, one bill I ran this year would have, um, re requires actually that all zero, uh, all autonomous vehicles, like the self-driving cars, be zero emissions by 2030. Uh, because they're going to put a lot of miles on the road, and they might as well be zero emission, whether that's electric, whether that's hydrogen, whatever it is, they should not be polluting. Uh, I also was able to secure $5 million to the sustainability decathlon that will be coming, I think, in 2023 to uh, the Orange County Fairgrounds. And what that is is it's going to be a global competition of, of folks to come into Orange County and design and build zero emissions, all electric homes. It's going to create a ton of tourism and hopefully create a lot of the innovations we need to scale up zero emissions home building throughout the state. But we have to be committed to zero emissions uh, across the board because if we don't, uh, we, civilization as we know it is not going to exist for our grandkids and great grandkids. And so we owe that duty to them. Summing Woman Quicksilver. I agree with most of what you said, but uh, I think one of the things that we're seeing is our younger generations, and I have four young adults, so they would hate me even mentioning them, but from the age of 24 to 32, and they're very concerned about climate change, even to the point of, of possibly not having children, which is, I've said to them as a parent, <laughs> don't put everything on your shoulders, but the point is we see classroom enrollment way down, and it's a, a true fact that uh, our younger generation is having less children. And we couple that with knowing that we have an aging, not only Orange County population, but across the United States. So we need to be concerned about just that fact. On the moving to 100% electric, I'm a little bit in the camp of, yes, we need to do that, but we also need to give people choices, so whether it's alternative fuels, but also know that some of our hardest working people who are working in hospitality, who are working um, in low wage jobs, uh, they're not in the market anytime soon for vehicles that are gonna cost twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. And uh, until we can have a plan for how you uh, can connect or charge, I should say, in the infrastructure, we need to be planning and moving towards there, but we need to also keep in mind that we don't put this burden on some of the hardest workers out there who aren't living in Laguna Beach, even though they may be the hospitality workers that drive to uh, the montage. So I'm always going to look at that, uh, our hardworking families out there. Well, if I could just Please. Uh, comment. Uh, I don't think we're disagreeing. Nothing I said was meant to imply that we're going to try to force people to buy $40,000 cars. Uh, but I think we in the legislature have a unique responsibility understanding the economic realities that people face, 
uh, to not, you know, have an unjust transition, uh, but, but to try to prioritize zero emissions as quickly as possible. Because if we don't, uh, it doesn't matter if you can afford a $20,000 car or not, because you won't be able to live for in most parts of the planet. And, and I, you know, I, just to give you one example of what we're trying to do on that front, uh, I, some of you may have seen that in response to the Huntington Beach oil spill, uh, I announced that I'd be introducing legislation to end all offshore drilling off state waters. But part of what we're doing there is exactly to Sharon's point, uh, we're trying to make sure that in that process we're not taking jobs away from hardworking people who work on those oil rigs. Uh, we want to make sure they have a transition to ideally better paying green jobs, whether it's offshore wind, whether it's capping those wells uh, or anything else. But we need to make sure we take care of re the real people uh, that, that work and, and, and don't leave them as collateral damage uh, as we try to transition to zero emission. Yeah. Well, that does, does it for our ability to do questions and answers. I wanted to open it up for the three of you. If you had any last minute thoughts or something that you wanted to share, we'll start with uh, Senator Min. Sorry, as you got your mic, he masked back on. My apologies. <laughs> No worries. Uh, th thank you, Steve, for a great job of moderating. Uh, thank you to the Orange County Aging Services Collaborative, uh, County of Orange, for putting this together and for inviting me to speak. Um, you know, I'm, I'm the new guy. Uh, you know, I just got elected last year. This is my first elected office. It's a steep learning curve. And I, I'm, I'll be honest with you, I'm learning a lot of these issues around aging. Uh, I, I start with the premise, the starting value that uh, seniors, you know, I, I was taught to respect your elders. And I think that we have to show that respect by making sure as a society that our seniors are able to live their post-retirement years in dignity. They're able to thrive, not be targeted with consumer abuse, to feel supported in the ways that we would do as a family. Uh, and, you know, I'm eager to learn from you all. To, in my mind, this is an opportunity for me to learn more than it is for us to tell you about what we're doing, uh, because there is a lot of interesting and, and really complex policy around uh, senior services around aging, around health, uh, and so I hope you will continue contacting me in my office because uh, you know I, I want to work with you, but understanding that I'm I'm the rookie and and I I don't know very much yet, but I want to learn. But thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Senator Deman. Assemblymember Quicksilva. Um, yes, again, and thank you for having me. Uh, I just go back to the critical conversations that we need to start having with our families at younger and younger age plans for uh, senior care plans for, uh, you know, how might they get around. We've just done that with my own mother in the last few weeks with uh, my family. I come from a very large family. We don't all agree on next steps, but having her involved, talking about, you know, this year, five years from now. And those are difficult family conversations, but that coupled with more education directly to uh, seniors uh, about what is available out there, because I learned just being on this panel um, more uh, that I didn't really know uh, about the transportation plan. So now I can access that as an individual for my own family. So I think it's about sharing information, education, and starting with your own family. Thank you. Director Danzek. Thank you. I just want to say um, thank you so much to the Orange County Strategic Plan for Aging and the City of Irvine for allowing the county to co-sponsor this important event. Um, it's our hope that just like we heard today that implementing our local master plan for aging is not just about what government's doing, it's about what we're all doing together collaboratively, um, understanding that this is a cross-cutting issue, um, not just um, transportation or housing or health care, but parks and recreation and uh, financial institutions, all those sectors that touch older adults um, in their daily work, we need to bring into the conversation. So I think that um, a big regret would be if this was just a one and done type of event. We need to continue having this conversation, almost like a train the trainer model where we have given the message and now we need others to be our messengers, to take that into your own communities, in your own sphere of influence and start having that conversation, bringing awareness about this big initiative so that people can get excited and step up and share their ideas. We don't wanna design anything in a vacuum. We actually want to hear from the people that this directly impacts and sometimes they're the ones that have the greatest ideas so thank you again for kicking off this event but I hope it's just one of many conversations that we have in the near future absolutely thank you um, 
Uh, there were several questions that uh, we didn't, unfortunately, didn't have time to answer. So if those questions were submitted either in the Q&A portion or submitted on paper, uh, the staff will do their absolute best to get those answers to you as best that they can. Um, I wanted to thank our elected officials, uh, all the representatives here today. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the uh, senior, Lakeview Senior Center in Irvine for uh, hosting us today. Thank you for taking your time out. Yes. Thank you for taking your time out today to learn and contribute to today's discussion, talking about the master plan for aging. Um, there is going to be a survey that's going to be sent out for, we, we do appreciate your feedback. We want to hear how things can be better, whether we do this again uh, virtually or hopefully again, where we can all be, uh, be in one room together um, and, and have a more of a cohesive opportunity. Keep a lookout for more events in 2022, the Orange County Aging Services Collaborative um, for, um, for future things. So once again, thank you all for being here today and have a great weekend. Thank you.